you I had seen some time back, you know. Happy to see you all here. Uh, we also welcome Mr. Sharan and Ami Jaktiani. Uh, the, of course, he will talk, and when he talks, you will know <laughs> a lot about him. Uh, formally, they will be introduced later. Uh, it's nice of you all to be here on Sunday morning. We have a lot of professionals here. They will also be introduced in due course. I'm following orders of my wife. You know. She told, she, she made me jump into the fire, said, you have to start the meeting. So I said, okay, I start the meeting. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. I think that's all that I have to say now. Uh, I'll hand over to Dr. Usha and uh, she will take on the further proceedings. A very good morning to all of you. And uh, thank you for coming, you know, especially on a Sunday morning, that too, on a festival day. And I really appreciate that, you know, uh, everybody whom I've invited are here. Uh, can I have the first uh, uh, slide, please? Uh, I would like to introduce, uh, you know, our uh, uh, moderator, um, who is a brilliant, uh, you know, radiologist, and uh, she has come all the way from uh, Pune. Uh, she is none other than Dr. Uh, Sonali Deshmukh, Dr. Sonali Varun Deshmukh. She's graduated, uh, she's, uh, she's from Bombay, graduated from, uh, you know, uh, Nair Medical College, and uh, she's done her post-graduation from one of the most esteemed institute, that is the Tata Memorial Hospital, and she has had a fellowship, you know, from uh, Belgium, and uh, I, I think she, she should, she's more like a Bombayite, you know, rather than, uh, you know, a Pune person, and uh, she has worked in uh, Kokila Ben Hospital, and the diagnostic centers, which is the My Mangeshwar Hospital Spectrum and the Nucleus Imaging Center. And uh, currently now she's working in Pune. Uh, again, one of the very renowned institute that is the Dinarat Mangeshkar Hospital and research center since 12 years. And a special interest of coming to, I think, Bombay today is uh, uh, her own family, which is here, and her child who is here. And she was just mentioning that she has not met her parents for quite some time. So she found this uh, good occasion to come here. Thank you, Dr. Sonali, for coming and taking the trouble and uh, being here with us today. And her special interests are, of course, cancer and body imaging, image-guided interventions, and chest imaging. But the, and also her current interest is promoting awareness in the society about preventive medicine and uh, modification, lifestyle modification, along with uh, you know organ donation drive. And uh, let me tell you that uh, she's just not an ophthalmologist, but uh, she has uh, taught several people how to, you know, uh, balance life and work. And she's been uh, given several awards, uh, you know, and uh, Lokmat Award. And uh, she's, I think, uh, uh, India Women Runner-Up and in some of the, you know, uh, ladies' uh, programs. So welcome, uh, uh, Dr. Sonali. So um, I would now next go on to, you know, our uh, the se second, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, uh, chief guest. It's a pleasure to have, you know, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Sharan uh, Jaktiani as our chief guest. It's really a proud privilege, you know, for me to introduce uh, our chief guest, that is Mr. Sh Sharan Jaktiani. And uh, he was a little tensed up yesterday when I told him that, you know, there's a pleasant surprise for him. And, uh, and thanks to his better half, you know, she has really updated me everything about him. So just a brief introduction about him. He has the highest qualifications of Bachelor of Law, Masters of Law from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. He's enrolled as an attorney at law, New York Bar, 
and is also a member of New York Bar. He has worked at World Trade Center in Geneva and US-based law firm in Washington, DC. Recently, it's an honor that he's amongst us and has received, you know, um, and he's been invited as a member, door tenant of 39 Essex Chamber of England and Wales. Sorry to tell uh, Mr. Sharon that we really don't understand this terminology <laughs> and you'll have to explain us this, what it is, you know? And he's currently a senior advocate in Bombay High Court and is probably the youngest and the most reputed advocate. He's been invited by Bombay High Court as amicus curiae to act as an impartial advisor to the court on special matters. He specializes in civil and commercial litigations and has over 200 reported judgments in the Bombay High Court and other courts. He's also involved in many public interest litigations, example, for environment and in international arbitrations. Sharon's debating skills and capability to argue with convictions were appreciated in his early school days. Lawyers, lawyers amongst the doctors are known to think on their feet to get out of a tight spot. It's like, you know, working on an emergency. And this quality is inbuilt in Sharon, which is the secret of his popularity. Sharon is very compassionate about giving back to the society. Despite his time constraints, he gives importance to instilling these values in his children by setting an example of hosting parties for orphanages, for orphanages and on special occasions. Being one of the busiest council in the city, one gets an impression that this would not give Sharan time to be an equally dedicated and involved father. But seeing him in action, we have to believe his dedication towards his children, be it in school or health-related issues. His recent article, which is published in the leading law journal, gives us an insight about his dedication, both in profession and personal life. Thank you for being with us, Sharan. Now, yeah. Over to Dr. Sonali. Now, I think she will play the role now. Good morning. A warm welcome to all of you. Namaskar, Namaste. Adab, Sasrikal. Came to Majama. So, like uh, Sir and Ma'am both mentioned, that uh, we are very glad to have all of you today on a Sunday morning, leaving behind uh, our usual uh, household chores and festivities which we are going through. Uh, we'll quickly start the session with. Um, uh, Ma'am, are we having the chief guest uh, speak over? Yeah, so um, we've all heard about our uh, enduring uh, guest of the day. Uh, please uh, come up on the stage and have a nice, share your experiences. Yes, I will. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First and foremost, good morning to Dr. Usha Jori and Dr. Ashok Jori and their families, to our moderator, Dr. Deshmukh, and to everyone who is here today physically and, and virtually on this Sunday morning. When you have an invitation from Dr. Jory, it doesn't matter what day of the week it is, it doesn't matter what festival it is. I think that our appreciation and our regard for both Dr. Usha Jory and Dr. Ashok Jory make sure that when the invitation comes, for whatever it is, it's the highest on any priority list. So Dr. Usha Jory, I know you said that we've taken time out on a Sunday, but I don't think anyone would have had it any other way. And that's really an, an indication of my sentiment and our sentiment towards uh, Dr. Jory and Dr. Usha Jory. A few minutes ago, as part of the introduction, it was said that I am known for perhaps arguing my way out of a tight spot. <laughs> I think I'll have to call on those skills on this Sunday morning. I was told yesterday that uh, there's a pleasant surprise, but I didn't know that the pleasant surprise involved speaking. But I really shouldn't have any excuses considering that this is what brings food on the table. Uh, so let me say a, f a few things about my experiences and let me try and say it um, within a reasonable period of time because I'm more interested in listening to the other people in the lineup. I think that I say this from a parent perspective. 
Uh, what is it when I when I come to Dr. Jory's clinic or when I come to the nursing home or when I interact with him at the Surya Hospital, and I look at all the other parents over there? Uh, it's oftentimes I've I've tried to understand uh, what is it that um, each of us as parents are feeling, given that we're all in a somewhat unusual situation of having children with serious medical needs and certainly serious when compared with the normal trials and tribulations that parents have to go through with their children. I mean, we are not talking about fevers every now and then or coughs and colds. We're talking about ailments far more serious, at least in the medical sense than that. And I look at all the parents around me. And there's one or two things that strike me about the parents that I observe and about the children that I observe when I'm in the precincts of Dr. Jory's uh, clinic and in the hospital. And what immediately occurs to me is that no matter what may appear to be a physically challenging situation um, when you have children who don't have the ability to function normally or independently, when you think of that objectively, it's the kind of circumstance that would almost paralyze someone's thinking, that would make them give up hope in life, that would make them give up a sense of meaning or a sense of purpose. And yet when I, when I look at the parents and I look at the children, the attitude and the energy that they generate is exactly the opposite. And I look at them and I look at people who have perhaps every reason to lose hope and to be paralyzed without hope, but who come in with a sense of energy, with a sense of purpose, with a sense of encouragement in their body language, not only for themselves, but for the people around them. And I think that that's just such a remarkable learning experience because it goes to show that you can be born into a situation of adversity or you can be a parent whose journey as a parent begins only with adversity and through your own survival instinct, through your own lessons, through your own belief and most importantly, at least in the context of today morning, through the agency and the assistance and the guidance that we get from such wonderful professionals such as Dr. Usha Jori, Dr. Ashok Jori, what seems to be or what could possibly be a hopeless situation is a situation which is filled with hope. And I think that is, we all know that Dr. Jori is a world-renowned orthopedician. I have never felt people treating me as a celebrity because of the doctor that I consult. I walk into a room and when we talk about Amira's journey and in the passing we mentioned that our orthopedic surgeon is Dr. Jori and suddenly you are a sought after man in conversation only because you happen to be a patient of Dr. Jori. That is regard and reputation but that is in terms of his medical skills, in terms of his surgical skills. I am talking about a power which goes much beyond medicine and the power that goes much beyond medicine is the power of giving people hope, giving people a belief that their child will walk when the odds are stacked against them, that you will be able to remedy or partially reverse a congenital problem when the odds are stacked against you. It is that which is the power of medicine, but more importantly, the power of being the person that Dr. Jory is. I'll let you in on a little secret. When Amira was born and we had all these doctor's appointments to go to, my, my, my wife and me would keep thinking that our mood in the house really changes from appointment to appointment. There was a life of so much uncertainty and I'm sure I speak on behalf of perhaps every parent that has walked into this building or walked into the nursing home. The life is one of great uncertainty. You walk into a doctor's appointment, you leave feeling good or bad about life depending upon what you've heard. And then many years ago we had our first interaction with Dr. Jory when our daughter was eight months old. She's now 12 and a half years old. And I soon realized that with Dr. Jory, I didn't get that feeling of highs and lows and highs and lows because his disposition is so even-handed. He says it like it is. And without actually ever telling you or being so overtly optimistic, just simply because of his reputation and because of the persona around him, you consistently walk away with hope. Even if he tells you that we have to have a surgery or it's going to involve surgical intervention, you know that if Dr. Jory is saying it, and it's under his hands and his care, then you're going to be better off post the surgery. So for a moment, you can almost ignore the concern of a 10-hour surgery or a 9-hour surgery because you know that the outcome is going to be 
positive. And for myself, and I'll only conclude with this because there are so many other people to speak, that it's not only what I see amongst this family of professionals and what they've done for my daughter. I've said this to my wife, I've said this to my family. It's the amount that I have learned as a professional in a completely different profession. I'm not a doctor, I'm a lawyer. But what I have to do as a lawyer is not sit across the table and advise people, I have to be in court. So it's the broad equivalent of being in the operating theater. It's the broad equivalent. Oftentimes when people ask me what kind of lawyer you are, the easiest way of analogizing or giving an example is to say that we're the equivalent, the broad equivalent of a surgeon. You go to the operating theater, which for us is the courtroom, and you operate. But it's about when I observe Dr. Jory over these years, I genuinely say this, I think it's made me a better professional in an entirely different profession because of what I've learned from him in terms of his dedication, in terms of his temperament, of course, in terms of his enormous skill and ability. So I just wanted to say that on this morning, on this Sunday morning, I speak on behalf of a large body of parents, most of whom I don't even know, but most of whose experiences I have gone through and vice versa. And we can only say that our association with Dr. Jory as patients and now hopefully more than that as, as friends uh, has been life-changing, life-turning. And I've mentioned Dr. Ashok Jory because he's, of course, the surgeon. But another secret, which is that I never lose the opportunity of wanting to come to Dr. Jory's clinic to get the paperwork done or to deposit the check because that gives me an opportunity to talk to Dr. Usha Jory. And it's happened more than once. And it's a, a very different type of conversation, but equally the kind of conversation that gives me the feeling that there is bright days ahead, that there are sunny days ahead. And our association with the Jory Foundation, the Jory family, is one of the reasons why I believe that no matter what disadvantages my daughter has had, she's going to have an extremely fulfilling life. So thank you very much for having me this morning as a chief guest. It's been a singular honor being here as a chief guest. My wife, who, like in many families, is the driving and thrusting force behind the well-being of my children, uh, shares my sentiment. So on behalf of both of us, we're deeply privileged and honored to be here. And thank you again. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. You actually took us through your entire journey. And at the same time, you kind of introduced all of us to the pioneer of this field. <laughs> Uh, we will uh, get on to the lamp lighting session. So please, I would invite the chief guest to come over. Can we have the cute little kids here for a nice welcome song, Come Prayer? Come. Hello, everyone. We are Sara and Ina Johari. A warm welcome to all of you present here.
please sing with us. Itni shakti hame dena data Ban ka vishwas kamzor ho na Itni shakti hame dena data Man ka vishwas kamzor ho na Hum chale nek raste pe hum se Bhool kar bhi hoi bhool ho na Itni shakti hame dena data Man ka vishwas kamzor ho na Dhoor agyan ke ho andere Tu hame gyan ki roshni de Har burai se bach ke rahe hum Jitni bhi de bhale zindagi de Bair ho na kisi ka kisi se Bhaav na man me badle ki ho na हम चले नेक रास्ते पे हम से भूल कर भी कोई भूल हो ना इतनी शक्ति हमें दे न दाता मन का विश्वास कमजोर हो ना हम चक्षास हम न सोचे हमें क्या मिला है हम ये सोचे कि आ क्या है अर्पण फूल खुशियों के बाटे सभी को सबका जीवन ही बन जाए मधुबन अपनी करुणा का जल तू बागे कर दे पावन हर एक मन का कोना हम चले ने के रास्ते पे हम से भूल कर भी कोई भूल हो ना इतनी शक्ति हमें दे न दाता मन का विश्वास कमजोर हो ना मन का विश्वास कमजोर हो ना मन का विश्वास कमजोर हो ना थैंक यू दैट वाज वंडरफुल Jory grandchildren. <laughs> right from the beginning till the end, the way they ended the song was also so sounding professional. That was so sweet of them. So we move on to the next part, uh, the most important part of the entire program. We will have a list of speakers coming up on the stage uh, one by one. Uh, of course, starting with uh, Dr. Jory sir, um, the distinguished person whom we all know about. So yes, none other than uh, Dr. Ashok Jori, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon here, who has uh, done a brilliant job and a pioneering work in this field for last so many years. Can we have, sir, uh, up on stage? Well, I, I don't think I need an introduction, formal introduction to this crowd, you know, because they know me as well. You know. So first of all, I must thank uh, Sharon and Amit for being here as all the parents, you know, but uh, what he said was really touching and inspiring, you know, it's inspiring in reverse, you know, and uh, as surgeons also, we need to think on our feet, you know, so it's not only lawyers, you know, as surgeons, <laughs> probably so much more important, you know, if any emergency happens or any complication happens, you know, we need to be really on our feet and fast thinking always helps the surgeons also, you know. 
So you are all with me on this journey of cerebral palsy. You know, we are speaking today with reference to cerebral palsy. There are many professionals who will be speaking behind me. I just want to sort of talk very informally on cerebral palsy because, as parents, there are a lot of concerns uh, for cerebral palsy. What is going to happen to the child? Will the child walk? Will the child study well? Will the child become an independent? personality in society will the child be as productive as his peers you know as his brother sister other siblings you know will he be able to do as well you know so a lot of concerns you know and concerns start with the diagnosis you know once the diagnosis of cerebral palsy is made you know absolutely it's a matter of shock for many families and many parents important is that parents are young at that time you know when the diagnosis is made barely like uh, they married a couple of years down the marriage and uh, very often the first child has cerebral palsy so it comes as a big shock you know, for uh, the parents and, and the family we all know cerebral palsy as uh, damage if i may talk in lay terms really as damage to the growing brain which can start even before the child is born you know so antenatal prenatal we call it two problems surrounding birth perinatal problems and sometimes even afterwards because of infections you know we generally label up to the age of 2 you know the brain is growing very fast and if anything goes wrong the child can have many issues issues affecting the brain depends on where in the brain the problem has occurred you know and most likely this occurs in the motor area of the brain motor area of the brain is the center in the brain which controls movements with movements is coordination you know but of course this is one of the largest problem in cerebral palsy but there can be other areas of involvement for example hearing can be involved vision can be involved because there's a diffuse damage to the brain coordination balance can be involved speech can be involved you know cognition that is mental faculties can be involved and they may not be as good for example for analysis analytical thinking or for mathematics they may not be as good so depending it's very unfortunate you know that small things can determine what is going to happen to the child in the future you know a small area of damage in the brain can really make a difference you know how big that area is or where is it located will determine the future of the child you know how do parents come to know i think you all gone through that experience you know of uh, cerebral palsy very often you find that the child is not doing activities which are normal for that age group of which the child's peers are doing you know so at 3 months this should be happening at 6 months this should be happening and that is not happening you know and then you get worried as to what what is the reason for this uh, not happening you know sometimes it's particular posture with the child adopts or the child crawls in a particular way or the child cannot balance in sitting standing could be a problem walking could be a problem so all these actually draw your attention and take you to professionals you know <coughs> now who sort of deals with cerebral palsy so for me it is important at this stage to emphasize that there is no single professional who deals with cerebral palsy you know all of us have a feeling oh i am doing great work you know <laughs> everyone feels so all the professionals here feel oh i'm 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 doing fantastic you know this is my field you know but it's not really so it's multidisciplinary because of the multi system involvement which is there you know so because a child may have motor problems but the child may also have problems in hearing or problems in vision very very common you know so multiple specialists are required and uh, the key features of cerebral palsy is that because the brain is affected control on the extremities is affected you know control is affected we use a term which is called as spasticity okay so all of you probably are familiar with spasticity it means the tension in the muscle or the tone in the muscle actually is higher than normal you know so when it is higher than normal rapid or fluent movement becomes a problem you know because the tone is high the muscle is sort of contracting all the time you know and uh, that spasticity prevents movement 
and that causes a stiffness in the body so that the person cannot walk freely and even if they are walking they are not able to walk freely this spasticity happens because the control of the brain is lost the brain what it does is to so in in a primitive sort of animal you know it is all reflex you know so you do something you make a noise and the person gets startled you know that's a reflex you know that doesn't really go to the brain but we as grown ups control ourselves you know so we may not get startled because the brain is controlling it you know brain sends impulses to our muscles these are inhibitory impulses you know which prevent us from getting startled you know so this sort of control is lost and uh, the tone of the muscles become high because the tone of the muscles become high it leads to a series of problems you know series of problem because if the joint is not able to move it will get stiff in a particular position okay if certain muscles are strong certain muscles are weak there is a imbalance across a joint and that gives rise to common problem uh, which we all face in orthopedics is deformity the child develop deformity because certain muscles are more powerful than the other or because of spasticity and weakness you know some muscles are spastic some muscles are weak and all this sort of um, they are not exactly the opposite of each other but because of all these neurological phenomenon and i think we have a neurologist speaking to us later on because of all these phenomenon contractures and deformities are produced and that actually brings up the question of physiotherapy and occupational therapy to allow these muscles to elongate allow these muscles to function to allow these children to gain milestones and better functioning of the upper extremity of the lower extremity all that so the field of physio and occupational therapy or rehabilitation therapists come up you know in this uh, particular diagnosis or this particular medical problem you know so it is multidisciplinary so all professionals are involved with the goal is the same goal is to make the child as we always have to keep that end goal in mind you know so we are not looking at an extremity we are not looking at lower limb upper limb or the spine we are looking at to the child as a whole person you know how can we improve the functioning of the child you know so this is a very very important perspective in cerebral palsy having said that you know i we they will be talking about the diagnosis part how early diagnosis is made how different methods of treatment are there early treatment and later on treatment i really don't want to go into the details of orthopedic surgery i would just like to give a few messages you know few messages uh, to the family and to the concerned parents is that early intervention is important making sure that your child is behaving as children do at that particular age group you know i i think we have to be vigilant for that and if we find that the child is not behaving as per norms i think you need to check it up either with your physician pediatrician later on with the neurologist maybe refer to physiotherapy or orthopedics or whichever specialty you know so that is that is important so early intervention is important uh, one message is don't delay even if the diagnosis is not cerebral palsy you know but treatment is required because the child is lagging behind we have certain terms like delayed motor development you know disorders in which everything will eventually become normal over a period of time you know maybe 2 years 3 years time the child will catch up and become normal you know, delayed motor coordination is there you know but cerebral palsy is something which will not become normal so after 2 years also you find that the child is struggling to do something which his peers are doing you know so it's it's not that the child become normal this is a lifelong diagnosis and um, cerebral palsy is not only children even adults i mean these children when they grow up they become adults they have different sets of problems so it's not a disease only of childhood it is a disease of adulthood also it's a lifelong disease you know so for the family i would just like to end by saying you know for the family what is important is participation you know an active contribution to the development of the child because all professionals they are like remote controls you know they are remotely touching your child you know but who's with the child all the time you know it's the family it's the parents who are there and the other people in the family who are there 
for optimizing results in cerebral palsy the family becomes most important you know because if the family is devoted to that child one will see the difference which happens in the child you know whether it is cognitive processes whether it's visual whether it's motor problems gaining milestones is concerned i think family has to be involved and goal setting becomes very very important so you say that okay we are aiming our current aim is what is our goal you know in treatment our current goal is to make the child stand for example with support or to take step with support and then whatever is required for that goal we need to do you know our current goal is making him learn better you know so that is also a goal so how can you do that you know and that may demand special education teachers etc etc you know when the child is young the brain is in the developmental phase and the child can you know develop better changes happen you know if we do something which is called as functional mri functional mri is mri as an activity is going on we find that lot of new activities and the brain undergoes something which is called as plasticity okay brain is plastic not only of young children but even of adults it is plastic and brain can adapt to a lot of challenges which are thrown to it you know and this neuroplasticity functions best at a younger age lot of we call it synaptic connections connections between cells you know so one cell takes over the function of the other and what the child is not able to do by learning by motor training this becomes possible over a period of time this happens with neuroplasticity and when they repeat mris in certain researches which have been done one finds certain areas of the brain which were not active becoming active over a period of time you know so this is important neuroplasticity is important getting involved with the treatment doctors can advise but who carries out the advice it's the family after all and if a child is performing better in large measure the credit goes to the family not really to the doctors because i i write my advice on paper i explain to you but if it is not done it's not done you know nothing happen nothing comes out you know so it's a tribute to the families uh, i always call them the heroes in the management of cerebral palsy they are the ones who are really struggling and really putting in the efforts uh, we are there to guide them to help them you know and in certain situations to rectify but largely it's a family effort so i hope um, dr usha jori ordered you have to speak so i spoke <laughs> but i hope that i've been able to give you some pointers and make some sense of this problem called as cerebral palsy thank you very much for your attention thank you so much sir you have given a wonderful insight uh, as to how we deal with uh, such children thank you uh, i would uh, like to mention here uh, for the entire audience so if you have any questions you need to ask uh, after for any speaker we going to have next few speakers in the line you can just jot down and we will have a question answer session at the end of the talks yeah and i would also sincerely request all of you to put your phones on silent mode so that we have a nice uninterrupted program we uh, move on to the next speaker and i guess before that uh, what i felt wh while sir was talking we should definitely have a round of applause to all the parents out here because they are the first ones to face the situation and take the brunt of the entire journey and we must appreciate that yeah so we we move on to the next talk Dr. Madhavi Kelapuri, who is also from Pune, and my colleague from the Nanath Mangeshkar Hospital, she is a pediatric physical therapist and is going to talk on therapist teamwork for improved outcomes. So, like Sir rightly mentioned, that it's a multidisciplinary approach to kind of contribute in getting a better quality of life of children having cerebral palsy. So, we are going to have respective topics covered by our speakers here. Here you go.
So Dr. Madhvi is associated with uh, Dr. Jori's for a very, very long time. That's what I realized after uh, reaching here, the location since morning. I've kind of, uh, I'm listening to all uh, nostalgic memories they have shared. And uh, I'm sure she is equally glad to be a part of this program and uh, traveled all the way from Pune early morning to give her talk. Welcome, Dr. Madhvi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sonali. I would like to begin by thanking uh, Usha Madam and Sir for uh, having me here. Uh, and uh, it really feels great to see a group of parents. I call all of them hardworking parents, and uh, their journeys are really different than ours. So talking about parent-therapist partnership, all of you have children with cerebral palsy. All of you all have been going through sessions of physiotherapy. And uh, you know you are more in touch with therapists rather than doctors. Uh, so how can we together make it better? Better for our children, better for all of us. Slide advancing, guys. So sir has given a very nice overview of what cerebral palsy is. And uh, you know, as he very correctly said that it is a lifespan approach. It's a condition which stays with the child throughout the life. Yeah. The problems that you face or the child face is varied. There are multiple types of problems. And as the child grows up, the type of problem may change. So uh, as part, the physical therapists look at the mobility part, the ambulation part, but most of us, most of the rehab professionals want these children to be contributing members of the society. So even though physical therapy will look at the ambulation part, but at the end of the day, we want the child to perform age appropriate skills. Chan Pude Baga. So as I said, the problems can be varied. For us to make it very simple to understand, we know that you know there are certain children who can walk. There are certain children who can walk with the help of some kind of assistive device. And there are certain children who are, uh, is it OK? No? And there are certain, ch certain children who are not able to walk. So for ambulation purpose, they are put on a wheelchair. So if we know typically that these are the levels that uh, kind of tell you how severe the child is. As a parent, everybody asks was first question to the doctors. Kitty serious? Kitna serious hai? Will my child ever walk? So for this particular purpose, we have this kind of classification which is in place. And this level can be assigned by the age of, say, three to four years when you know that you know what kind of level your child is in and more or less throughout the lifespan this level remains the same it doesn't really change now our aim is to make the child get better and better in his own capacity right so how can parents really help so as sir said that we are working on the goal everybody wants their child to walk but when you come to a uh, therapy Therapist typically assesses what are the abilities, what is it that the child is able to do. And if you discuss it with your therapist, they will be in a position to give an, uh, give an idea to you as to what is the potential of this child. You know, it not just in terms of walking, but uh, till where can the child really perform outside. It's not just, as you always see that in the therapy uh, uh, premises or in the therapy room, the child is at its best, you know. You can see them perform so well, but does that transfer into reality when he goes out? You know, that's the reason where that's where the therapist can really help you in setting goals. And when I say goals, although our ultimate goal is ambulation in terms of physical therapy, but we always have small goals. You know, 
like a three month goal or like a six month goal and the goal could be like taking a few steps from the classroom gate till the seat the goal could be going out in a restaurant the goal could be eating in a uh, you know so family function you know so we are looking at functional independence where the child should be able to perform all his day to day tasks very well so look beyond ambulation look beyond uh, the child in his own uh, home setup or in therapy setup but look at the child and have goals which can be really realistic and achievable and when it comes to realistic therapists are there to help you as to what exactly is, is the meaning of realistic when it, when it comes to your child uh, so uh, when you go for therapy uh, you are also a part of the child when he performs therapy therapists are always aiming that the child enjoys the session the child is an active participant of the session but what you can do as parents is when the child is not with the therapist or when the child is uh, going to school or when he is going for playing or when he is going to some function you know you need to observe what kind of a posture the child is in because we believe that optimum or a very very good posture is the basis or the or so called foundation for better performance so how much ever we stress on this good posture good movement happening in the therapy the same thing needs to continue many a times you see that the child is in a position to perform better only if you give him a good seating posture so how the child is sitting in the school how the child is sitting at home just slouching in a sofa doesn't really help whereas if the child sits in a good 90 90 chair where his leg legs are you know part of his base where weight is passing through his legs where he is able to use his hands in more productive way that is always going to help so as parents i feel it's very important for all of you to see how your child is sitting and working uh, we have a uh, uh, talk on splinting and bracing but i feel that this is a very integral part of any kind of uh, rehabilitation once your child has cerebral palsy because as sir mentioned they have muscles which have spasticity so the muscles are short or they are tight and in order to maintain the length in those muscles it is very important that they use something called as night splints because that is a form of low intensity gradual prolonged stretch now if the parent understand the importance of night splinting then it gets transferred automatically to the child but if the parent has an attitude of oh it's so difficult how uh, how is my child going to sleep in that you know that gets transferred again to the child so i think so uh, as uh, the therapist tell it's very important for the parents also to transfer this information or somehow make the child understand the importance of night splinting also the bracing because when the child wa they walk they tend to have pressure on the wrong points on the of the foot which may you know damage create further damage so uh, braces so splints and braces they are used during walking and they are extremely important last and uh, important point is carry over so as we say that we don't want parents to become therapists therapy at home is also important but we but we don't want a structured therapy program that also should be carried out by parents you know once the child knows what is therapy like once the parent understand what is the importance of good posture whatever that happens throughout the day with the child be it eating be it having a bath changing clothes studying if the child goes to school all this if that happens in a therapeutic way that is that can create a very very positive impact in long run so even if you are not able to make them do exercises per se at home see to it that whatever happens happens in a very good therapeutic way also you can help uh, them by teaching uh, rather preventing wrong patterns or compensations which further lead into complications so i feel this carry over is extremely important once you understand what is happening in therapy try to put it 
a cross in the uh, routine of the child and also have some other there are nowadays lots of other uh, kind of adjuncts or you know time where the child is having his own time without doing therapy so if swimming for example or aquatic therapy is really good you can take them to parks most of the parks are not accessible but you can make your own tiny adjustments and take them to parks you know all such activities uh, uh, there is some or the other kind of uh, therapeutic intervention happening i feel and as the child grows up you know like beyond, beyond 12 years of age there are always uh, gyms and uh, some kind of aerobic activity is so important like a stationary bicycle where uh, the child gets doesn't get like feel the burnt out of doing therapy for so many years so i feel uh, in conclusion uh, you all know that rehabilitation is an ongoing process uh, we it's for us to uh, have that interest going in in the child by being innovative uh, it's very important to incorporate it in daily life and with parents contribution i am sure that the, we can face these challenges more efficiently thank you thank you so much thank you dr madhvi Uh, she explained the role of rehabilitation so well and gave us uh, a lovely structured talk on how not to be structured and having it the natural way at home uh, taken over by the parents so we have the next talk Our next speaker of the day is uh, Mukda Vagshan. So uh, she's an occupational therapist and is going to talk on impact of diagnosis and inclusion in mainstream. Please welcome Mukda Vagshan. and happy to have lot of connections with her too it's so warm to come back to mumbai always hello everybody still morning so good morning thank you ma'am thank you sir for giving me this opportunity and this stage uh, i have been associated with sir since i think 2001 with our uh, first common patient who is now a 35 year old mba and we have quite a bit of uh, common uh, children that we worked with one of whom will be graduating from cooper hospital next year is an intern now so the reason for that topic slide sir kar nahi Yes. 
Yes, so I am going to talk from impact to inclusion. And the basic thing is, is this better? Yeah. So the basic thing is, what happens after the diagnosis? And this is the general journey of most of the parents. May not be, some of you might have skipped some stages here. But the first thing that happens is denial. मेरे बच्चे के साथ ये हो ही नहीं सकता मेरे साथ भी ये नहीं हो सकता गलत है हट ये गलत डॉक्टर है दूसरे डॉक्टर के पास जाओ कुछ किसी वैद के पास जाओ हकीम के पास जाओ वो हाँ वो सब करो सिर्फ यही नहीं है अवर सोसाइटी इन जनरल यू आर गोइंग विद अ चाइल्ड दैट इज ड्रूलिंग विल गिव यू टू थ्री नेम से ओ यू शुड गो टू दिस वन दिस इज द बेस्ट पर्सन अराउंड Oh, you should go to that one. That is a better person. What are you doing for your child? You are not doing anything. Then the next comes the anger, which stays for a really long time. Why is this happening to me? How dare you, God, doctor, whoever it is? There is a lot of anger about what is happening with the child, what is happening with um, the direction in which the child is moving. The next stage comes as bargaining. Novina me, no budhuar ko no candle jalaungi. Siddhi me naayak chal ke jaungi. Haji Ali pe chadar chadaungi. Depending on whatever your religion is. Then they done it really, really hits you. It's like, uh oh. And then comes the acceptance. In this process, it's a generally a known process for almost two years till you reach the acceptance stage. Some go through all the stages within six months, till others take almost two years to reach this phase. The best part is, none of you as a parent, in so many years of my experience, it will be 30 years in February, stop getting the help that they need. It is your own mental cycle that you're going through, but it does not stop your dedication towards your child. So hats off to all of you. Once the acceptance comes in, that's when they are really able to, and that's why I have this uh, puzzle there, they're really able to put that puzzle together and form the complete picture. That is the most important piece in the puzzle to complete it. Once the diagnosis is done, it's not just the impact on the child, it is also the impact on the rest of the family. How is it financially? Either itna kharcha hai, her therapy ka itna session ka hai, usko ye therapy chahiye, usko wo therapy chahiye, usko ye operation chahiye. How does that work financially? How does it work emotionally? On other people in the family, who is going to be the primary care person? Who is going to be the secondary care person? How are you going to shift this balance? How what is going to happen to the siblings? Again, there's another puzzle there that the heart has to be whole, which is the heart for the entire family. And that child becomes the heart of the family, pulling the entire family together in spite of all of the problems that the child is going to go through. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Uh, do you need for me to go through the presentation again very quickly? Uh, okay. So, sorry, the screen share was not happening. So this is what happens with anger and denial and depression. And then this is the puzzle that I was talking about earlier because I couldn't see the slides. The best part that I have found in so many years is most of the time is the first child that's diagnosed, as rightly said by Dr. Johari, and in, by the time that child is a little stable, they have, most of the parents go for a second chance with the sibling, which is about four or five years this child's junior, because it takes that long for, you know, the entire process, okay, ye bacha abhi line pe hai, abhi dusre ka plan karte hai. And that second sibling becomes the older sibling as the years go by. <laughs> They start taking, a lot of times also that I have found is that 
as the younger sibling is starting to crawl and starting to walk, the milestones tend to match and they progress together. That is the best part of having that sibling because it's your own self. Yes, there is a lot of team effort and because I'm a therapist, my therapist slide moves, the others are stationary <laughs> things. But there is a team of doctors, there are neurologists, there are ophthalmologists, there are ENT surgeons, there are uh, orthopedic surgeons. That is the entire team of doctors. With the therapist, it doesn't, it is physiotherapist, it's occupational therapist, it's speech therapist, it's respiratory therapist, it's art therapist, it's music therapist. Everything come together because movement is an issue. With just psychologists, it's not just psychology, it's also counselors, and then come the educators, which is why the first educator and the last educator. And a big, 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 huge bow to all the mothers because they are the primary and that is what they are doing all the time. In fact, I was trying to see if I could label each one of those balls because that is what they are doing all the time, keeping everything up in the air. So hats off to all of you all. Take a bow. This is the main thing. Since 2016, a lot of laws and rules have changed, providing rights to all of our children for education. The inclusion into a mainstream school involves these things. This is the thing that the schools check. Is it possible for your child to sit for a particular period of time? Uh, is there some amount of instruction following? Is toileting an issue? Because most of the schools have 30, 40 children in a classroom. And if your child needs help for toileting, that is something that a school is hesitant to let your child in. Are they able to protect themselves from fall? What is the access provided by the school and how is your child able to na navigate through those spaces? And what is the support system that your child requires, that your child needs? If you are ticking all of these things, you can approach any school. And I'm very happy to state that in Mumbai, of course, I'm from Mumbai. So in Mumbai, 80% of the government BMC schools are now wheelchair accessible. 20% they are still working on. Teachers have been trained to deal with children with special needs. But if they have a class of 45, you can <laughs> almost imagine how your child is going to get lost. But I have been working with quite a bit of uh, schools. And the willingness to take on a child is there today. It wasn't there 20 years ago. But since 2016, 17, pre-COVID, this is during COVID, again, a lot of things changed. But pre-COVID, there are certain principals who will take on that child. <coughs> Our children are eminently trainable. And the reason to put them in a mainstream school is to have friendships. You think in terms of your own friends. Our friendships have started in school, and those are the friends. You don't have to call them every day. But just then, our phone karo ke, wahi conversation wahi se hi chalu hota hai. You want to provide that to your child. The sibling cannot be the only friend that your child has. The second thing is, they need to know what is happening in regular, and I'm saying regular here, I'm just going to change that to mainstream. This is how children behave. Ek dusre ki masti karte hai, ek dusre ki tang khichte hai. Woh masti wala jo environment hai, humare bachche kahi reh jate hai. Because school, therapy, study, ye, wo, usi mein wo reh jate hai, masti karna bhool jate hai. Bhoolte nahi hai, mokka hi nahi milta unko masti karne ke liye. The third thing is, if you, there is an acceptance from the society as well. Oh, he's going to which school? Oh, this school, you know. It makes a big deal on the mental faculties of the parent that, okay, in this school, there is peers and we have had an opportunity to work with a lot of children with disabilities who come into the school. It teaches other children how to deal with them. See, as a strata of society, kafi bar aisa hota hai ki hum dhakka mar ke nikal jate hai, kisi ke haath mein kaathi hota hai. Par uske saath jo tis bachche hai, wo kabhi kisi ko dhakka nahi maarenge. Kyunki unko malo mein humara dost hai. I'll share a small incidence with you. And the reason for that is that the Bang movie had released. And after that, we had a child with special needs in a normal school, ICSC school, second standard children. 
and the Hindi teacher was asking to do something, she probably having a bad day. Teachers can have that. And he was not able to find his book in his bag. And she said, Aray, manda buddhi hai kya? Nikhalta nahi sahib kitab. The entire second standard children had seen Dabang. And in that, the Arbaz Khan character is called Manda Buddhi by Salman Khan. They don't know what it is. They know it's a bad word. They put their pencils down. The entire, it's still giving me goosebumps while I stand here. And the next day was the test. They didn't write their paper. Entire second standard kids did not write their Hindi paper. They said, Usne hamari dost ko gali di hai, teacher ko bolo, aake sorry bole. This child was with them since senior KG, so they knew his difficulties and knew his problems. But that is the kind of friendship that they need. I'm so proud to say he's passed 10 standard last year. He's not a COVID batch. But he has those 30 friends for life. That is something that is possible after 2016 with the new All-Inclusive Act. I'm not painting a very rosy picture here. Yes, there are problems. But if your child has reached that stage of going to school, you have already dealt with a lot of things. This is the next step. And the, the teaching community and the education community is ready. Most of the schools have occupational therapists on premise in the school. And it is possible for this to happen. So let's all try for putting our children in mainstream school so that others in their class get an opportunity to learn about kindness, to learn about sensitivity. Thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. Uh, she was so expressive while talking, so it, it really made us uh, get involved in that talk. And uh, we move on to the next talk. Mr. Pankaj Sinha here? As Mukda rightly pointed out, that it's so important for the rest of the children also to know how to deal with friends like this. And uh, I'm glad to have uh, got that opportunity of taking my children to such schools and such centers so that they get sensitive towards this right at this age, rather than uh, having to deal with it later on in life, giving off embarrassing reactions. So. I was pleased to go through your talk. Thank you so much. So here we have uh, Mr. Pankaj Kumar Sinha, a prosthetic and orthotic specialist, who is going to talk on the role of bracing and orthotics. Welcome on board. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, ma'am, and thanks, sir. So just and this first time I'm going to interact with the, especially with the parents, and I will try to just give the. Just to summarize this thing, and I will give you the brief uh, orthotic and bracing application and why this is needed. So I'm just talking about the different type of the different orthotics and bracing and why this is required. So we know the, this is the different type of devices that we are applying over the body. And that is giving the, means the different supports, different protection, different corrections, things and all. But same time, uh, the device has to be unburdened. Means I, I don't want to focus that this has to burden the child. And maximum parents are complaining, after this, my child is not that much mobile and all. But same time, if you see the another aspect, this is needed. As a, 
as Jory sir told and uh, Dr. Mukda told, ki the, uh, ki the therapy line and the surgery line is needed this. This is not the question of the choice. And sometimes, if the parents, as a parents, if you are not convinced this concept, then how you can think your child is going to accept this? So when I'm doing this, I'm starting my assessment and then I'm telling, you are the a major team member and we are working the path team member in the sideways. So you, first, you have to convince yourself to, oh, this is going to help to my child, and then accordingly your child will accept. This is not the question, okay, the sir is telling, the therapist is telling, and I am telling, and then you have to act, your child will accept. So first, you have to convince, no, this is the options for my child, like a surgery, like a therapy and all, and then the bracing will help to my child to do the day-to-day -day activity. Definitely his child, so he, he's doing uh, everything with your support now. But do you think when he will be 15 or 20 years, then you will carry the child and you, you will do the different activities? You, you will not do that. So, uh, so in that way, if you see the different type of the, the orthotics and all, so why we need orthotics? So orthotic bracing devices for the lower extremity as well as upper extremity and the spinals to control movement without applying resistance to the desired or appropriate range of motion. It can be optimally align a joint into a better functional position, whether it is the position of the hand or the elbow or the knee or the foot. So if you see the different type of the things, so if, uh, if you go through the different posture alignments and all, like if your foot is twisted outside, the, the, your, in your body at the same time two lines are acting. One is the gravity line and another is the alignment line. If your alignment is twisted partially, and in that way, you are not putting your foot properly. Do you think that your child is going to stabilize and walk? Then the entire thing has to be haphazard, and you will find that gravity is working, the alignment is disturbing him. So he is walking, but he is not walking in a different crook manner. So the focus of the bracing is that we have to align the thing. So it has to minimize the effects of the limb spasticity. If you go to the proper orthotic and bracing, providing support of movements and the additional energy required, and reducing the risk of the accidents or the falls, and helping to stabilize the child. And that's why I'm always telling that this is the alignment issues. If we are working on the alignment, so the proper alignment of the foot of the key to the providing a good and balanced posture. And the alignment has to be analyzed in both static and dynamic phases. We cannot think only that he is standing and this alignment is correct. But when he's walking, the different biomechanical forces, means different forces acting on our body. And in that way, we have to stabilize. But for that, we have to be very much sensitive to how this is going to help when he's not standing, when he's taking steps also. So when person is only standing, that is the posture alignment. And when walking, that is the ambulatory alignment. So if uh, you will see this, uh, the poor alignment of the foot is the key to the providing of the good and balanced posture. The alignment has to be analyzed in both static and dynamic phases. Means when person is only standing, that this is again going on the posture and the ambulatory alignments. So your postural alignment is the, or the bracing and orthosis can change postural stability, pelvic tilt, decrease certain tissues, stresses, and improve foot and lower limb function. They do this by realigning the tracking the muscles and tendons into the particular joints and decreasing the stress. Orthotic changes are the pelvic tilt along with your knee and a hip and alignment. And this improves your body functioning ability and reduces the likelihood of developing pain and more serious pathology. So if you will see this, the different type of the full body pain, why we are finding the different type of the pain, if the, your entire posture is disaligned, you will find, no, this is going and this is happening in this way. So and the, if your foot is twisted, you will find the stress over this, up to the spine and the neck also. So the, it means after the support and the stabilizing orthosis, we are trying to achieve the maximum alignment as, we, as much as we can. And in this way, the ambulatory alignment is, there is a good research of the evidence to suggest that wearing a pose or any type of the bracing improves balance and functional mobility of the person who can walk on their own by limit movement of the foot and ankle joint, which is often needed to be the improved walking pattern, provide support for the unstable ankles, maintain the best ankle and foot position, especially where increased muscle tone is present. Muscle tone means the level of the tension of the muscles. 
Some AFO have different spatial characteristics and all, where we can augment the range of motion, we can adjust the range, we can uh, decrease the movement, we can increase the movement, we can give the stabilization and all. So I, I just I, there is some videos you can see if, if, the, if the, how this is the in towing and the some pronation amount is there. And if you find the, the speed means cadence, the, they are taking the step to a step that is slightly unstable and all. But with the application of the brushings, they are much more stabilized with the proper footwear. They are walking uh, uh, properly and there is a the very less fall in the patient also and the entire thing is aligned. So uh, I'm not talking about the different designs. I'm talking about the different type of the posture alignments and the ambulatory alignments. How, if you see this is too much tight and the foot is going entire in the, uh, in the medial deviation that is known as pronations and all. And, the, and we, we, we have we definitely, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about the only bracing, this is the question of the entire team has to work, uh, including the surgeon, therapist and all. But same time, the bracing role has to come and then in that way, the child ha has to improve the mobility with the entire stability to the ground. And then they, they will find, no, I'm, they are uh, uh, spending the less energy while walking, standing, means that they're standing in dynamic alignment. So prevention of deformity is so prevention is better than cure. So preventing progression of deformity in its early stage plays a major role. Orthotic bracing helps to prevent deformity progression by the limiting con contractures angles of the joint at their initial stage. Controlling the foot deformities by encasing them in proper position. Properly aligning the foot in maximum correction while standing as well as walking. And accommodating deformity at its present stage to reduce to prevent further progression. So if you see this, uh, there are so, so many uh, types. This is just photographs. And if you see, uh, I cannot take the video because the ch this child cannot walk without any support and all. But the hip is good. The same time, the f entire foot is in the equinus, and then heel is around seven centimeter up, means around two and a half inch. But we be, I have designed these things, bracings, and the entire uh, I have loaded the entire foot so she can touch the foot with the bracing and all. She is having severe deformity, the knee contracture and all that uh, and everything. But the, with the minimum design, with the, some rollator, with the posterior walkers and the anterior walkers, at least she is able to take some steps and she is standing. So this is the question of the bracing, where definitely uh, different procedure will come. But we, the, if you are standing, then you are, you are doing something. If you are walking, then you are doing something. So in that way, we have to set our perspective and we have to act. So uh, early intervention of this, the bow leg, the, this is the uh, photographs. Uh, I have a video in this, but it's a long video. If you see that this is too much knee is going in the uh, in, entire in, in the virus. And with the bracings, we have aligned this, and then he, his posture is much more balanced. So in, uh, and again, I, I told you that okay, this is not the outcome uh, of the only bracing. This is the question of the okay, enhancing outcome of the surgery and therapy. Bracing not only enhance, but also helps to improve outcome of the surgery and therapy. Bracing maintains the correct position of the foot po post surgery and also helps to prevent recurrence to the contracture and deformities. Using a brace after therapy session helps to maintain the muscle tone and also reduce the tightness. And brakes uh, act as a mechanical support during the different type of the gait patterns and all. So, and this is uh, helping the therapist also, okay, they are working more efficiently next day when your child is going for the therapy session. Means they are, they are working for one hour, but next day if you are not doing the bracing, again they are working for that. But if you are doing the bracing and all, then that is helping them to do more better effect, effectiveness and all. So the, the different, after, after surgical intervention, uh, he's around uh, 18 years old guy, and he's, uh, he needs support and all. And then definitely, uh, it, 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 like a surgeon said, he needs the only very much little upward movement that is known as that dorsiflexion. And we have given the different type of the joint. So the, his, he, if his posture is entirely different. 
just uh, for just understanding, I, I just uh, I've taken a video, a small video. If you see this, the, he is walking in the uh, rectus is tight, hem is tight, foot is going in the pronation and all, and he's just taking a steps. But if you see the stress over the the bar, parallel bar, this is too much, and he's not able to balance. But with the bracing lines, again we, we have limited the foot uh, uh, movement. It is not going too much up, and if you see the stress over the bar. The how he is holding, and this is less effectively means he is not giving too much energy, and then he is able to walk. And this is the progression we are noticing because he is coming to me around uh, five to eight years, and uh, every time we are analyzing, definitely the surgery and therapy is going on hand by hand. And then now he is walking on the with the elbow crutches, and he is much better with this. Uh, another thing I would like to add: if always be, I am recommending. The, the user has to use with the, along with the bracing and the orthotics the different type of the good footwear. This is not the question just down to the foot. We have given the black rubber or yellow rubber and all, and then he's walking. Means, see, the bracing is the replica of your anatomical foot. But if I am enhancing, like if you, we will imagine, if you are walking without the shoes or without the things in, on the road, we are not that much stabilized. But with the proper footwear, we are too much stabilized. And this is going to enhance our performance because the base of support is good. So uh, always I'm telling definitely this is a good practice some, uh, for the therapy line and all. Inside the therapy, they will not use the shoes. But we will not only focus the or inside the therapy or inside the house. We have to think of the broad aspect. So though, no, child is going to out. Child is going to the store and child is going to visit the relatives and all. So how I the base of support will be more and then child is much more better in this position. And the, uh, the different type of the, the dynamic bracings are also there. So in that way, uh, if the adductor tightness is there, only uh, sometimes we are using the static bracing. Sometimes, and I'm recommending the therapeutic bracing if the different type of the adductor tightness and all. So this is giving you the the, the, the spasticity will come and the adductor will be tight. But this is enhancing gradually. You can control this thing. So it is going in the abduction. So this is the two posture pictures we can maintain as per requirement, like a 30 degree, 40 degree abduction and all. So these are dynamic bracing and all. So this is also helping the like, child lot. So this is the small things and, and definitely if you have a question, I will like address. Thank you, Mr. Sinha. Uh, you covered this topic in depth. Our next speaker is Dr. Reno Agar Kherkar who is also my colleague at Dinana Mangeshkar Hospital and a very dear friend of mine. We've traveled from Pune together. Uh, I would like to mention here that um, having this program today is uh, Dr. Usha Jhori's baby, or I would say she's a mastermind behind having it. Uh, while Dr. Reno has taken the inspiration and has shown keen interest uh, to work in this field, for children with special needs and has been, has played a very significant role in contributing and coordinating this program. So I welcome Dr. Reno. She's a pediatric ophthalmologist and a neuro ophthalmologist and is going to talk on the topic, I can see, but what and how do I see? Here you go. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sonali, and uh, thank you, Dr. Johri, for having me here today. Okay, so uh, there are some important questions when we start with uh, uh, start about children with cerebral palsy or uh, even other children with special needs. Uh, the question arises right from whether the child can see or not when the child is a small baby and uh, uh, the child is not achieving uh, proper milestones from birth. So uh, the, the, ch the uh, parents usually end up uh, going to uh, their pediatrician, that is the first point of contact, and uh, then maybe to a developmental pediatrician and then they'll start recognizing what problems they have. And eventually, they start wondering whether uh, the child is not achieving milestones um, uh, because the child is not able to fixate, not able to see. 
uh, vision is a very important uh, a part of uh, the development or achieving milestones because most of the things a child is going to learn is by seeing others and if that aspect uh, the child is lagging behind then uh, a lot of it uh, the, the even the therapist gets stuck at a point because they are not able to demonstrate certain things to the child or the parents because the child is not able to follow so uh, so important questions is does my child see and if yes the parents uh, really need to know whether uh, what does my child see and how the child sees so there are some uh, today i'll be just talking about some simple things which parents can do at home uh, to find out how the child is seeing or what the child is seeing and then they can uh, depending on uh, whatever are their findings they can go and report to uh, uh, a specialist so coming to visual acuity how do we assess uh, we can start with simple things uh, observing if the child is having uh, first of all whether the child is able to make out whether it is day or night is whether the child is able to see light at all so there are children where uh, there is no blinking response even to bright lights and the parents are confused so they can start with seeing if the child is able to respond uh, with a, a good touch light if the child is uh, giving a good uh, a blinking response to light then the parents know that yes the child is able to at least see light from there if the child is able to see light we go to the next stage where if the child is able to focus or fix it we look at the response and see if the child is able to look at faces the child is able to smile the child is able to follow if you put the child down and then you walk around the child and see if the child is able to follow wherever you walk you start with simple toys and um, of of interest in front of the child and see if the child is able to fixate follow uh, the toys if the child is not doing that maybe you can uh, take up some lighted toys and go in a dark room and see if the child is able to fixate and follow lighted toys in a dark room so if the child is able to do that then uh, th then again that is plus 1 at least the child is able to uh, fixate lighted objects so that is how you look at visual acuity second is comparison if the child is able to fixate and follow so uh, second is comparison now if the child is able to fixate and follow and we don't know what is the uh, vision of the individual eye a very simple thing you can do is just cover one eye and see uh, what is the response of the child if the response is eco the response is very good then you know the uncovered eye the child is seeing very well with the uncovered eye now what i did in this child where in this photo you see i covered the left eye and the child was very comfortable seeing with the right eye but the moment i covered the right eye the child started crying and just wouldn't see so that gave me an idea that maybe the vision of the right eye is very good and that is the eye the child is using to see most of the things but the moment i cover the good eye the child is very uncomfortable and he is not able to see the left eye so that also helps um, uh, the parents the therapist and the ophthalmologist to plan the treatment protocol uh, in regards to how to improve the vision of the child so then we come to uh, certain other test these are some tests which we use in babies where we have uh, uh, like some uh, paddle now this is called um, uh, lia paddles where uh, where normally what we use is um, there is a patterned paddle in one hand and there is a plain paddle and then the child is uh, considering that the child the children are uh, more attracted to patterns so now the child is looking at the pattern so you know the child is able to see so this is for very small kids uh, for older kids we this is the next test which we move where there are these certain symbols and uh, even children who are not able to speak we give them a small key card which will have all these um, uh, signs and then the child is uh, asked to match and these uh, symbols they go on reducing in size this is very similar to a test which was which is done for an adult but they are pictures now next is accommodation now what is accommodation so when we look at um, our our eyes are naturally given the 
ability to focus at different distances. So when we look at uh, far off things, our uh, eyes naturally focus on something far and we are able to see clearly. When we start, and at the same time when we start reading, our eyes naturally uh, focus on the reading material. But uh, that is called accommodation. But a lot of children with cerebral palsy, their accommodation is uh, affected and they are not able to read as well. So our routine eye examination can give an idea about uh, what is the accommodation and probably if the accommodation is poor, that can give us an idea if the child is having some reading or writing disability or uh, difficulties in school and those things can be treated. Next, coming to external examination, we need to look uh, at uh, the look of the child if there is any other, along with cerebral palsy, are there any other uh, genetic issues, are any other syndromes involved, that also can be corrected. Then come next coming to the anterior segment examination or the actual eye examination, we look at all other abnormalities, if at all there is any uh, cataract or any other iris abnormalities, any other retinal conditions. So detailed eye examination has to be done, which obviously your uh, eye doctor or ophthalmologist will help you out with. Then also we need to notice if the child is having any sort of squint. Squint is very common in children with uh, cerebral palsy. The in, 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 turn, in turning of the eyes is called esotropia. The ex uh, outer turning of the eyeball is called exotropia. We need to see if the, it is constant or it is intermittent and treated accordingly. Then next is the binocular convergence. Uh, convergence is also very important for reading and writing. So when we look at anybody's eyes, when we look at anything which is far, our eyes normally come out. And when we look at something which is close by, our eyes are supposed to come in, which is called convergence. If that is affected, that also is could be an important factor where the child is having uh, difficulties in reading and writing in school. Then uh, we need to look at eye movements. If uh, the eye movements are full free in all gazes, now coming to pursuits and saccades. What are pursuits and saccades? This is also, these are also eye movements. Now suppose if I'm looking at an object and object of interest and then I have to look at, I have to shift my focus to another object of interest. We are, uh, normally we are able to shift focus from one point, point A to point B very easily and we are able to uh, move back and forth. So they are called saccades and keeping our um, uh, attention on a point of uh, interest on a moving target are called pursuits. These are very, very minor things and which are normally not covered in routine eye examination. But a lot of these children do have problems with saccades and pursuits. And uh, that uh, is a very important point where they have issues with reading and writing. Because where they will uh, uh, face a problem is if there is a text given. And normally uh, when we are reading, we are able to very easily shift from one word to the next in one line, come to the next line and start again from the left side and go go to the end of the line. So children with cerebral palsy who have gaze and uh, gaze abnormalities, they are not able to shift from one word to the other very easily, nor are they able to shift from one line to the next line easily. And this can happen even from letter to letter. So if that is detected at uh, an uh, early stage, uh, we, we all also have a lot of um, uh, uh, orthop uh, orthoptic assessment and vision therapy. And we work on that and the children can do, there is like a marked improvement in the academic performance when these um, things are taken care of. Then we need to know if there is any abnormal eye movements that also can uh, lead to difficulties in reading and writing where uh, if the child is having any um, uh, stability of eyes or nystagmus, that is called shaking of eyes. The next important thing is contrast. Why contrast is important? If the child is performing, uh, a lot of children, they do have issues with contrast. If we have, we do a routine eye examination, a child may end up reading uh, uh, nearly up to the, there are children who read even up to the last line and the vision per se is very good. But still they are not able to follow in school. They are not able to understand what is written on the board. A lot of schools these days, um, uh, they have digital screens or they have uh, green boards and white chalk and they use uh, pink or yellow on green. So they do have uh, uh, children with uh, contrast issues. They are not able to get a very good contrast and they are not able to follow what is happening. So uh, we need to find out if the child actually needs a little higher contrast to understand and then uh, we need to make those um, uh, things available during therapy as well as the school needs to be informed uh, about the need of the child and the school can take care of those issues. Next we uh, look at stereopsis or depth perception. So depth perception is important when we have to deal with issues with hand-eye coordination, 
uh, that also again is uh, important in school in performance in writing reading walking running jumping getting down steps so if um, the child is not able to gauge about the third dimension of uh, a particular area then the child is going to stumble and uh, not able to walk or uh, can have reading writing issues as well so that also needs to be uh, tackled then uh, this is a read now this is an uh, instrument called read realizer uh, this also measures depending on if the ch child is having any gaze or pursuit problems this is this will give you an idea about how the uh, video on the left is showing how a normal person reads but the one on the right is showing a person who has uh, eye gaze abnormalities so these children normally they tend to overshoot and then they come back they undershoot and this is how a child reads with gaze abnormalities and that is why um, when the child is not able to read properly there is a, a difficulty in comprehending what the child is reading and there the child may lack so when we uh, when we identify this problem and this can be uh, this this can also be tackled with therapy uh, there is a marked improvement obviously there is a marked improvement in the academic and the scholastic performance and uh, last and most important is the visual field testing now what is a visual field uh, for example if i am looking straight i am looking straight i can see some pictures on the back of the wall but even without looking around i can see okay there is there are people standing here there is uh, the ac here there are people standing here so this is my range of vision so even when i'm looking straight i can see a lot more world apart from just the straight what i'm seeing Uh, children with cerebral palsy a lot of them they do have visual field defects they may not end up seeing uh, properly on either side up down they're not able to see there so this has to be identified uh, uh, early so that the therapist and um, the doctors treating know if the child is actually having some field defect and the, uh, the they start working on the fields which are stronger if the therapist is working in the field or the gaze which is not very good the child is not able to see the child will never respond to therapy so we need to identify if the child actually has any field problems and depending on that then we we need to strengthen the fields which are better a very simple way of identifying at home if the child has any field a uh, test is uh, there are certain um, tools which we can we use in clinic but it can also be very easily done at home uh, what you can do is you can just give something of interest to the child uh, say any toys or videos where the child is focusing and somebody else from behind or the side comes with another uh, toy or uh, thing of interest from the side so even when looking at a point of interest if the child gets distracted to that area then we know that yes the child is realizing something else is coming from the side and this can be repeated on in all direction so this is something which parents can test at home and if they feel there is an issue that has to be reported back uh, to the therapist and obviously uh, taken in of uh, should taken a uh, ophthalmology consult so these are some um, basic things which can be done at home in identifying the issues so if these issues are identified at an early age there is a good chance that um, we can work um, with the therapist the ophthalmologist can be involved and work with the therapist and to give a better um, or a faster um, uh, developmental uh, the, the child can reach their developmental milestones much faster if the vision problems are also tackled along with the other uh, motor problems with the uh, which the children with cerebral palsy face thank you thank you dr renu it's been a pleasure to uh, listen to you and with all the details about the role of an ophthalmologist in uh, uh children with special needs we move on to the next talk yeah sure yes we are carrying out the study since almost 5 years what i noticed in the children with this developmental disability and cerebral palsy is the parents are forgetting that 60 to 70% of the brain is related to the eye problems and this was grossly neglected and so we have been uh, together you know we are carrying out study in uh, the major institute like aims lv prasad eye hospital adapt 
and the Spastic Society of Karnataka and Goa Medical College. And we have carried out a study of almost 154 children. And we have found that almost 85 to 90 percent of the children are having eye problems, out of which 70 percent are correctable. So what happens is, you know, this is a take home message for all the parents that I understand extremities are very important. You have to look into it. But if the eyes are not functioning properly, you know, you have to look into, you know, the uh, eye problems also. And we are trying to bridge a gap between the ophthalmologist and the vision rehabilitation specialist so that, you know, we can do justice for these children. This is a message for all the parents. Her message reflected the amount of work she's put in this field. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, so the ne next talk is on the approach to low vision in uh, CVI. We have the optometrist who's going to talk on this topic on the behalf of Dr. Himika Gupta. Welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, hello, everyone. I am optometrist Mayuri. Uh, I would like to, before starting my presentation, I would like to thank Jauri, uh, ma'am, and also Himika, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity to present in front of you all. my topic for today's approach to low vision in CVI patient. So before starting uh, this topic, uh, I would like to explain you the each terms which I have mentioned here. So low vision, what is low vision? So uh, the so what is low vision? Uh, vi the inadequate vision which requires to uh, do our uh, daily activities, it is known as low vision. So by, uh, if we talk uh, in terms of number, so vision uh, less than 618 to up to uh, 6 to uh, 120 uh, is known as low vision with uh, limitations in our uh, visual field. we are talking about low vision in uh, patients with CVI. Uh, so CVI is the cerebral uh, visual impairment or uh, it is also known as cortical vision impairment. Uh, so it is an, a damage to an bra uh, damage in a brain at a, a specific part which which is responsible for visual processing uh, and uh, CVI is seen in patients with CP uh, uh, be uh, because of um, hypoglycemic insulin or hypo, uh, hypo sorry, because of hypoglycemic insulin during prenatal, postnatal or after birth uh, in children. So, uh, Universal dis uh, Unique Disability ID. Uh, it is a great initiative uh, carried by a uh, government of India. So uh, it is a card which uh, we have to enroll for uh, patients with disabilities. Uh, for this, we require only our Aadhaar card, and uh, they'll do a uh, general assessment. And uh, based on our uh, our assessment, they will uh, tell us the how much percentage we are. Uh, able to how much percent a uh, disabled the child is and uh, it will be helpful for uh, child in their uh, future in their future yes so I'll s uh, most of the assessment part is carried out by uh, dr. Vin uh, Rino ma'am so I'll be talking about the visual stimulation exercises and low vision aids which are uh, available for a uh, patient 
so uh, if you see uh, when we talk about vision stimulation or vision therapies uh, we cannot directly jump into the so we cannot directly jump into the uh, like if you see if a child goes to a school he uh, he or she cannot uh, teachers cannot directly start with alpha, uh, alpha uh, words or the sentences we need to start with the alphabets so in vision uh, therapy we always need to start with visual stimulation exercises in which we have light stimulation so as uh, reno ma'am already explained us uh, like uh, we'll start with light therapies and all so the first thing a child can see is light and dark thing he can differentiate so we need to firstly focus on that so uh, the first photograph which you see there it is just a light stimulation exercise so we can normally do with uh, torch light and uh, on torch light we need to put some filters uh, so that a normal white torch light on that we need to put a filter so uh, with different colors so that uh, uh, we will get a different colors light and with that with the help of those lights we will start the vision stimulation so how we do this vision stimulation is that just we have to put light directly in front of a child and we we have to see first how much he can able to see let we we constantly have to tell them ki dekho light dekho light dekho kaun si light hai samne se rakhna hai then we have to move in all gazes uh, horizontally vertically and uh, once the child starts seeing it will extend the distance of that vision stimulate uh, of light and will make them see through uh, distance light uh, and there are other uh, things also of uh, once we start वंस वी एबल टू सी दैट हाँ बच्चा देख रहा है लाइट को रिस्पॉन्स दे रहा है तो उसके आगे हम बढ़ेंगे कि दोनों आँखों से देख रहा है देन विल गो एंड कवर वन आई एंड विल ट्राई टू असिस्ट विथ अदर आई एक आँख से देखना है फिर एक आँख की थेरेपी देनी है देन एक आँख हो गया फिर आफ्टर सम टाइम अदर आईज सो दिस थिंग वी हैव टू स्टार्ट विथ इट एंड नॉट ओनली विजन सिमुलेशन uh we need contrast also for patients uh to uh, to assist matlab vision is not only what we see but with uh vision we have visual acuity it is a composition of five elements visual acuity uh, field of vision contrast stereopsis jise hum depth perception kehte hain and color vision so we have to or uh, give exercise on each part of them hmm? so uh, for uh, and it goes uh, hand in hand with the uh, of phys physiotherapy occupational th therapy and uh, vision therapy everything goes hand in hand with speech therapy also uh, so if a patient is not able to walk or uh, hold things it also comes in vision part कि उसे दिख नहीं रहा है इसलिए ही इज नॉट एबल टू वॉक दैट माइट बी अ पॉसिबिलिटी या फिर ही इज नॉट एबल टू सी दैट्स वाई ही इज नॉट ग्रैपिंग थिंग्स सो वी ऑलवेज हैव टू लुक फॉर इट वाइल डूइंग विजन थेरेपीज वी नीड टू सी वेदर अ पेशेंट विच अलॉन्ग विथ विजन विच पार्ट ऑफ अ पेशेंट्स सेंसरी मोटर्स आर एक्टिव सो वो चीज़ हम पकड़ के उसके साथ जैसे ही जैसे अगर हम देखें कि वो ही सेंसिटिव टेक्टाइल तो फिर हम उसे कुछ ऐसे ऑब्जेक्ट्स देंगे जो फील uh, करने पे उसे थोड़े टेक्टाइल ऑब्जेक्ट्स देंगे फॉर uh, उसके वजह से हम उसका विजन भी स्टिमुलेट करना स्टार्ट करेंगे hmm? वैसे ही अगर ही इज़ वेरी ही इज़ गुड विथ साउंड तो हम म्यूजिक थोड़े से म्यूजिक्स लगा के फिर उसके विजन थेरेपीज को स्टार्ट करेंगे या फिर लाइट के साथ एक डार्क रूम थेरेपीज होते हैं अगर पेशेंट इज़ वेरी हाइपर एक्टिव तो फॉर दोज पेशेंट्स वी हैव डार्क रूम थेरेपीज ऑल्सो कि विल पुट दैट पेशेंट इन अ डार्क रूम एंड विल दैट पेशेंट विल ऑटोमेटिकली गो काम 
and then we'll start exercises for that hmm? uh, and we have a uh, lia uh, uh, lia cognitive uh, assessment tool also available so these are few things which we get in that kit so the first which we see it has different shapes with different colors so this will help in uh, for patient with tactile and uh, color uh, uh, the patient who have good color uh, combination and tactiles so that we have to match this uh, the patient has to match this thing then uh, it will go on contrast the second part ki alag alag shape hai wo ek ek contrast mein uh, uh, usko align karne and to keep on those puzzles now these first two is all 3d assessment tools the third one is 2d assessment jo plain paper hai us pe hame uh, we have to match it the patient has to match it uh, then uh, there are this uh, yellow uh, mailbox direction cards so it is mainly to uh, see the patient uh, to improve the patient's orientation will uh, give the uh, will keep a card uh, give white card on patient and and that uh, mailbox or uh, circle tool will put in our hand keep in our hand and we'll ask that patient to uh, try and to put th that card from the uh, upper chart yeah uh, and we'll just change the directions of it uh, to see uh, the patient is able to do it or not and then uh, we have uh, smiley cards also so it is usually a patient को अलग अलग स्माइलीज इमोशन वाइज वगैरह हम दिखा सकते हैं कि लाइक विथ हाई कॉन्ट्रास्ट टू इम्प्रूव द कॉन्ट्रास्ट ऑल्सो द द लास्ट थिंग विच आई हैव मैंशन देर इट इज एन रेक्टेंगुलर ब्लॉक्स सो दिस इज टू अरेंज इन विल गिव दैम रैंडमली एंड विल सी वेदर द पेशेंट इज अरेंजिंग इट इन size uh, this ascending uh, order and all so uh, types of low vision aids which we have is a uh, optical uh, devices non optical devices and electronic assistive uh, uh, devices and softwares so in optical devices uh, mainly we see uh, magnification uh, gla uh, glasses optical devices mein what will require for a patient is that उसे दूर का दिखे उसके साथ उसे नजदीक का भी दिखे फॉर नियर व्यूइंग पेशेंट नीड्स मैग्नीफायर्स एंड फॉर डिस्टेंट व्यूइंग विल गिव देम टेलीस्कोप सो इन मैग्नीफायर्स वी हैव टाइप्स वी हैव मैग्नीफाइंग स्पेक्टैकल्स सो विच वी विच इज नॉर्मल स्पेक्टैकल्स बट इट हैज टू डिफरेंट डिजाइन अस्पेरिक एंड प्रिजमेटिक सो अस्पेरिक डिजाइन Uh, as these glasses are uh, very uh, high number high power glasses they are, they will be thick if we see in spheric part uh, so we'll advise them a spheric design glasses uh, which are comparatively thinner and the prismatic glasses uh, as uh, already ma'am uh, told us that the, if the patient is having squint or uh, if the patient is having squint or uh, uh, Le, uh, not having a uh, stereopsis those patients uh, not have binocularity those patients will need a uh, prism for their sorry uh, those patients will need prism glasses so this prismatic glasses high prismatic glasses will give them so that the uh, patient's binocularity will uh, regain and with the help of binocularity it will be uh, helpful to get them the stereopsis and then magnifier in magnifiers we have various types of magnifiers uh, so uh, to for spot reading we'll have dome magnifiers uh, or this uh, magnifier stand magnifiers and then if the patient is reading uh, continuously uh, if he wants to read a complete line we have a bar magnifier so that he can easily read those uh, magnification glasses uh then we have telescopes so telescopes are uh, there in two types monocularly and binocularly uh so monocular telescope uh, will give patients uh, 
the binocular telescope uh, will uh, advise patients uh, who have nystagmus, the continuous shaking of eyes. So if we close one eye and give telescope only in other eye, so that will be very difficult for the patients to uh, get, uh, to target or to fixate at the distance point. So for those patients, uh, we can uh, advise and we can go with uh, binocular telescopes uh, to uh, see the uh, image clearly. Whereas the monocular telescope will, uh, we, we can help in patients having uh, low vision, uh, means less vision in both eyes, but it has comparatively better in one eye. So we'll uh, try to uh, enhance that better eye with the telescope. And then we have other filtered glasses. So uh, filter, uh, we have filters, uh, lenses also, so which is uh, helpful of patient who is having albinism or uh, the patient who have uh, photosensitivity in uh, bright light or in under sunlight. Hmm? These are the monocular telescope and binocular telescope. Hmm. Then there are uh, non-optical devices. Uh, so for children uh, who uh, having problem uh, while writing or reading, uh, so we can uh, advise them the uh, uh, writing guards. So the, the first uh, image is showing that writing guard, uh, so it has a uh, uh, space between in which a, a child can write uh, in a single line. So the sec second image which I am showing there is that uh, a reading lamp and reading stand for a child. So uh, in many patients uh, we see uh, the near uh, vision is uh, improves with bright light, with bright illumination, with a, a good uh, reading angle. So for that, uh, this is helpful. Then uh, we have a signature guard for signing on check. We also have check guards, uh, uh, which uh, which is uh, which is having blank spaces in, so that we can put on a paper uh, on a check and we can write things there and there is one more thing is known as notex so notex is a simple card uh, which has uh, it is shaped in our uh, uh, we have the notes which we have in india so ba uh, based on that the patient just have to uh, keep a note uh, if a blind patient or the a very poor vision patient he can put that note on that uh, card and he can uh, feel and he he can recognize ki which note is this. And these are the assistive devices. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Mr. Mukesh Doshi. Yeah. He is a prosthetic and orthotic specialist here. Welcome on board. He's going to talk on assistive devices in cerebral palsy. Here you go. So, thank you, Dr. Sonali and uh, Dr. Johari, to give us the opportunity. So, I'm just giving you some idea about okay, what kind of assistive devices we use it. Now, when the patients start coming to us, we make a customized things practically, and uh, we make all customized molded collar, belt, and braces so that the people can utilize their functional value maximum. OK, 
Okay, we make a various kind of a hand splintings so that the we keep the every limbs in a proper position alignment as for the requirement of therapists and the doctors. And then we make a very self-help devices. That means if the people are not able to achieve the finer moments, we can have a low temperature thermoplastic granules. You can just heat it into a warm water, put it into objects, make a functional value so that the people can utilize his hand in a very functional way. Uh, various kind of a lower extremity orthotics, one of my colleagues, Pankas China, has already explained to you. But we make a various kind of a AFO as per the evaluations with the therapists, doctors, and we also put a lot of corrections if we feel like to do it. And we make a various kind of a walkers, assistive device technology, wheelchairs, customized wheelchairs, battery operated wheelchairs. And uh, we use a special kind of a cushion to prevent the back source from a gels and other things. Plus, most of the wheelchair, you can make it like a platform, like a stretcher. Uh, we can make a wheelchair like a platform so that you can make the patients lie down on the same wheelchair also. And then we make a customized positioning vacuum cushions. So these cushions we make as per the custom molded. And the beauty of this cushion is a reusable several times. So after two weeks, if the air gets leakage, again, you can fill up the things or you can change the positions. And you can use this kind of a cushions so many times. If you buy the one cushion, it usually lasts to you about eight to 10 years. And you require a one suction pump so that you can suck the air or you can blow the air and you can reuse the cycle of the cushions. We do a lot of home modifications, car modifications. So everything, we assist the patients home visit the things, and then we do the modifications. And everything is nowadays available in this country. We don't have to depend anything for the overseas, but I'll be glad to tell you that we do a lot of exports to all over the world. Uh, various kind of uh, hearing aids is always useful in a cerebral policy, but this is not my subject, so I don't want to say anything on these hearing aids. Now, we recently we have started a smart glasses. So this glasses is an innovation with a robotic engineer and intelligent engineer and the P&O industries. These glasses usually used for a low vision or a no vision person. It makes audio, any vision, any object which come in front of you, it make into audio and it speaks. It identify currency notes. It can read on an 18 language, English, Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi, any language. And uh, it also gives you 400 objects. And uh, right now, we are going to increase to 800 objects. So this kind of a uh, vision glass is available with us and uh, is not so expensive also. Usually, the software we give upgradation for uh, five years so that the people can do automatically upgradation, like how you get it upgraded in your soft, uh, mobile phone. So this glasses is also useful nowadays. So thank you very much. We go, I got a privilege to work with two cerebral palsy masters. One is Dr. Mullah Firoz, and one is Dr. Ashok Jowari. So, so thank you very much, sir, for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Desai. Uh, it's been very crisp, yet very, very informative. Um, so our next speaker is already here, uh, Dr. Nilu Desai. We welcome you. Yes, he's spoken about something very innovative, and uh, I'm sure uh, it has left behind uh, a lot of uh, inquisitiveness towards knowing more about this amongst all of us seated here. So that's the crux of having a, a very quick talk where we give away the information at the same time, uh, leave behind the audience thinking to ask uh, more details later on at the end of the session. So Dr. Nilu Desai, a warm welcome to you.
So we are at the fact end of the talks and uh, the most important role being of a child neurologist. I hand over the mic to you. Thank you, Dr. Johari, for calling me for this talk. And I'll, be try, I'll try to be as crisp as the previous speaker. And um, so I'm going to speak on epilepsy in children. Uh, before I start, can raise your hand. Okay. So epilepsy or mirgi ki bimari, it affects around 1% of all children. 70% but adults jinko fits shiru hoti hai, it starts from childhood. And uh, remember there's no one test which will tell you ki epilepsy hai. Like just EEG kiya, normal aya, nahi hai epilepsy, ya MRI kiya, normal hai, nahi hai epilepsy. It's not that, it's a clinical diagnosis. Ye doctor ke judgment pe, aur bhoat sari cheejo hai, jis pe dependent hai. Aur generally, standard of care hai, single drug, but around one third patients mein wo single drug kaam nahi karti and then you have to use multiple drugs so that is uh, sometimes those two three drugs may also not work and that is when when you call it drug refractory epilepsy so sabse pehle as parents aap, the role is to identify matlab pehle jab tak aap suspect nahi karenge ki fits hai you won't go to the doctor to sabse pehle bachcho mein kya movements rehte hain jo hum log Traditionally, conventionally, सोचते हैं पूरा हाथ पैर tight हो गया, आँख ऊपर हो गई, झटका हुआ, वो होती है मिर्गी. But मिर्गी में बहुत अलग-अलग प्रकार होते हैं. छोटे बच्चों में खाली चौकना, एकदम below one year, two years के खाली चौक जाना और uh, sudden behavior change, कुछ झट abnormal movements ये भी fit के प्रकार हो सकते हैं. थोड़े बड़े बच्चों में just blank हो जाना, कुछ काम करते-करते response नहीं करना, blank हो जाना. Sudden gil jana, achana gir jana, bina reason ke chalte chalte gir jana. Kabi kabi even pet me dukhna, abnormal, ulti hona, neen me se utke ulti hona, or unresponsive ho jana. Ye sabbi mirgi ke prakar hai. Bohat dar jana, bina karan ke bohat panic ho jana, dar jana jake, ma bab ko pakar lena, ye sabbi fit ke prakar ho sakte hai. Quickly, kya type hote hai fits ke? Ek generalized seizer hote hai. Just shuru to hote hai kisi ek particular part of brain se, but rapidly puri brain ko involve karte hai. That is called generalized seizure. Aur ek hota hai focal seizure, jo shuru hote hai eki side se, aur eki side pe limited rehte hai. Those are called focal seizures. So ye do main prakar hai. Fit ke karan kya kya hai? Kyun aati hai fit? Ya to brain ke structure mein koi kharabhi hai. Jahaan banawat hai brain ki, us mein ya to structure barabar nahi hai. Kisi karan se paida ishi paida honne ke pere jab brain form hua us mein ko defect hai ya fir agar kisi karan se injury ho gai ro bachcha roya nahi sugar kam ho gaya to kuch part brain ka damage ho gaya stroke ho gaya damage ho gaya uske karan wo structure mein change ho gai wo common karan hai apne desh mein kabhi kabhi anuvanchik genetic gen genes mein defect honne ke karan bhi fit a sakti hai family mein kabhi rahega kabhi wo pehla case ho sakta hai कभी कभी कोई मेटाबॉलिक डिसऑर्डर्स होते हैं जिसके कारण आ सकती है इन्फेक्शन हुआ है ब्रेन में टीबी की गांठ है कोई और इन्फेक्शन है जिसके कारण आ सकती है कभी कभी प्रतिकार शक्ति आपकी इम्यूनिटी ही फिट का कारण बन सकती है और बहुत सारे केसेस में अननोन रीजन बहुत बार पेशेंट्स पूछते हैं कि उसका तो सब नॉर्मल है कुछ प्रॉब्लम नहीं है फैमिली में फिट कैसे आ रही है Almost half patients, we have a research study in which there was no reason for the patient to be fit. And sometimes there can be multiple reasons. It can be genetic, it can be structural. And to confirm what is the reason, we have to do more investigations. What do you think of the investigations? Generally, the doctor will ask you a question, what is happening, how 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 is happening, EEG में समझता है कि बच्चे को fit के discharges है कि नहीं, but वो normal आया है इसका मतलब fit नहीं है, ऐसा बिल्कुल भी नहीं है। MRI करेगा देखने को कि कुछ structure में खराबी है, वो भी normal आया तो it does not mean कि fit नहीं है। These are all helpful, but there are none, no one test is confirmatory कि भाई ये आ गया मतलब मिर्गी है, ये नहीं आया नहीं है। Treatment क्यों करना है मिर्गी का? बहुत बार 
बहुत पेशेंस बोलते हैं कि नहीं वो हमारे बाजू वाले ने बोला उसने बोला दवा देंगे तो ब्रेन डैमेज हो जाएगा प्रॉब्लम हो जाएगी बच्चे मंद बुद्धि हो जाएंगे बिहेवियर खराब हो जाएगा पढ़े नहीं ऐसा हमेशा नहीं होता हमको मिर्गी क्यों ट्रीट करनी पड़ती है अगर नहीं हुई बच्चे को चोट लग सकती है इंजरी हो सकती है गिर सकता है पानी में हो गई तो डूब सकता है रोड क्रॉस करते हुए तो एक्सीडेंट हो सकता है सो वही उस कभी कभी वो एक जान लेवा भी हो सकता है मिर्गी का दौरा अनकंट्रोल फिट्स रहेंगे तो बुद्धि पे असर बिहेवियर पे असर कभी कभी साइकेट्रिक इश्यूज हो सकते हैं सडन अनएक्सपेक्टेड डेथ हो सकती है अननोन रीजन पर जिनकी कंट्रोल नहीं है फिट्स उनमें डेथ होने के चांसेस हैं कभी कभी बड़ी बड़ी फिट आई तो और पार्ट्स ब्रेन के डैमेज हो सकते हैं जो कि नई प्रकार की फिट्स क्रिएट कर सकते हैं और एक सोशल डिसेबिलिटी है स्कूल में आएगी बच्चे एक बहुत जगह अभी भी थोड़ा एज अ स्टिकमा लेते हैं तो वो एक रीजन से कैसे ट्रीट करते हैं जनरली दवाओं से 70 परसेंट केसेस में दवाओं से वेल well कंट्रोल हो जाती है कभी नहीं होती कभी कभी हम कुछ प्रकार की डाइट यूज कर सकते हैं कीटोजेनिक डाइट मॉडिफाइड एटकिन डाइट कभी कभी अगर एक ही जगह से फिट आ रही है और वो एरिया ब्रेन का कोई इंपॉर्टेंट फंक्शन नहीं कंट्रोल कर रहा तो ऑपरेशन करके भी वो पार्ट निकाल के कर सकते हैं या फिर इसमें दिख नहीं रहा पर वेगल नर्व स्टिमुलेशन करके है वो भी एक कभी कभी यूज करते हैं बट बैकग्राउंड में सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट है अच्छी नींद होना बच्चे का जब बच्चे की स्लीप डिप्राइव होगा फिट आने के डेफिनेटली ज़्यादा चांसेस है दवाएं बराबर से लेना कोई भी रिस्क टेकिंग चीज़ें नहीं करने की और एजुकेशन नॉट ओनली घर के लोगों का बट जहाँ पे भी स्कूल जाता है इसको स्कूल टीचर्स को पता रहना चाहिए इमरजेंसी केयर क्या है अगर वो क्रैश में जाता है उनको पता रहना चाहिए कि क्या बच्चे को मिर्गी आई किसको कांटेक्ट करने का कैसी पोजीशन में रखने का इमिजिएटली क्या उसको दवा देने की वो सब चीज़ें पता रहनी चाहिए किस कारण ट्रिगर जिनको टेंडेंसी है फिट्स की कब फिट आ सकती है अगर दवा भूल गए हंड्रेड आ सकती है नींद नहीं हुई बहुत थकान हुई बीमारी है बहुत ज़्यादा स्ट्रेस एक्साइटमेंट कभी कभी जिनकी फोटो सेंसिटिव एपिलेप्सी है उनको फ्लिकरिंग लाइट्स डिस्को लाइट्स वीडियो गेम्स उससे भी फिट्स आ सकती है अडोलसेंट बड़े में ड्रग्स अल्कोहल ये सब से भी ट्रिगर हो सकती है लड़कियों में जिनके पीरियड्स आते हैं मैंसुरल साइकिल के दौरान फिट्स बढ़ सकती हैं अगर आपके सामने कोई बच्चा फिट आ रहा है बच्चा या एडल्ट किसी को भी फिट आ रही है शांत रहना चाहिए टाइम करिए सीजर घबराने की जरूरत नहीं है एक साइड टर्न कर दीजिए उसको लेफ्ट राइट जो कन्वीनियंट है जनरली अगर मिर्गी का पेशेंट है डॉक्टर लोग एक मिडाजोलाम इमरजेंसी स्प्रे प्रिस्क्राइब करते हैं वो रहेगा उनके पास अगर वो स्प्रे रेडी रखिए देखिए दो मिनट हो गया वो स्प्रे यूज कर सकते हैं क्या नहीं करना चाहिए बहुत ज्यादा टाइट पकड़ लिया सब लोगों ने उसके मुंह में ये चम्मच डाल रहे हैं जूता डाल रहे हैं कांदा डाल रहे हैं उसकी जरूरत नहीं है टिपिकल uh, ये एनीवे anyway, ठीक है एक बट दिस इज व्हाट यू हैव टू डू टाइम इट टर्न इट टू वन साइड जो मैंने सब बोला वही चीजें इस पिक्चर में डिपिक्टेड है हॉस्पिटल क्या हर फिरगी के पेशेंट को हॉस्पिटल में इमरजेंसी में ले जाने की जरूरत है नहीं अगर फिट पांच मिनट से भी ज्यादा है स्प्रे दे दिया उसके बाद भी देन यू हैव टू टेक अगर बार बार फिट आ जा रही है एक के बाद एक और बच्चा पूरा होश में नहीं आ रहा ये बच्चों को जरूर ले जाना चाहिए अगर फिट आने के बाद बच्चा फुल्ली तरह नॉर्मल नहीं हुआ एक घंटा हो गया और अभी भी बच्चा टोटली नॉर्मल नहीं है पानी में फिट आ गई कुछ चोट लग गई फिट के दौरान ये सब चीजें हैं जो रिस्की हैं और ऐसे केसेस में हॉस्पिटल लेके जाना चाहिए पेरेंट्स की क्या जवाबदारी है इस केसेस में मिर्गी के जिनके बच्चे हैं बराबर से टाइम पे दवा दीजिए अपने आप से दवा एडजस्ट कम ज़्यादा बंद करना अच्छा है छः महीने फिटने आई बंद कर दिया ये नहीं करिए डॉक्टर की सलाह के सिवाय कुछ मत करिए एनश्योर एडिकुएट स्लीप रेगुलर डॉक्टर ने जैसे फॉलोअप को बुलाया है करिए बहुत बार बच्चा फिट नहीं आता दो दो साल तीन तीन साल नहीं आते अननेसेसरी दवा देने जब बंद कर सकते हैं तो भी दवा चालू रहती है आपके पास इमरजेंसी केयर हमेशा रहना चाहिए अगर फिट आ गई मिडाजोलम स्प्रे है उसकी एक्सपायरी चेक करके रखी है कैसे यूज करना है चेक करके रखिए कभी कभी इमरजेंसी के टाइम वो बाहर ही नहीं आती दवा एंड देन यू आर स्ट्रगलिंग रात को आ गई तो एंड एजुक आपके जहाँ पे भी बच्चा जाता है स्कूल ट्यूशन्स नेबर्स 
फैमिली सबको पता रहना चाहिए उसकी बीमारी के बारे में और इमरजेंसी क्या करना चाहिए फिट के दौरान वो पता रहना चाहिए और एक डायरी भी मेंटेन करिए अगर बहुत फिट आ रही है कब क्या ट्रिगर है महीने में कितनी बार आई डॉक्टर को जब फॉलो अप करेंगे तो वो बहुत हेल्पफुल रहता है वेन दे कैन रियली सी कि कब कोई पर्टिकुलर टाइम है हमेशा आ रही है क्या ट्रिगर रहा है हर बार सो दैट कैन हेल्प इन कंट्रोलिंग योर सीजर्स ऑल्सो कुछ भी अब नॉर्मल हरकत है विच यू आर नॉट श्योर वीडियो एट स्मार्टफोन्स एवरी वन हैज नाउ डेज वेरी यूजफुल टूल डू नॉट ओवर प्रोटेक्ट अरे ये नहीं करना यहाँ नहीं जाना उधर नहीं करना ये खाने को नहीं देना डोंट ओवर प्रोटेक्ट अलाउ पार्टिसिपेशन इफ इन स्कूल एक्टिविटीज रिक्रिएशन स्पोर्ट्स इनफैक्ट अगर स्कूल स्टॉप कर रहा है प्लीज टेक अ टेल योर डॉक्टर एंड टेक अ लेटर फ्रॉम देम ओके बट ये सम रिस्की एक्टिविटीज लाइक ट्रेकिंग है स्विमिंग है दो शुड बी अवॉइडेड साइकिलिंग driving in adolescent that should be avoided but all other activities regular play regular participation in activities can be done caution as i said ye sab cheeze hain jisme bicycling horse riding driving rock climbing these are things which has to be done with caution ghar mein bhi agar atmosphere safe rahe carpeting of floors sharp corners avoid rakhe tables ke bachcho ki safety matlab bunk bed wagaira rahega to avoid unko upar sulana साइड में अगर रेलिंग रहेगी तो अच्छा रहेगी बेदिंग के टाइम टेल देम नॉट टू कीप द डोर क्लोज्ड सुपरवाइज रहेगा तो अच्छा है जो केसेस मोस्ट केसेस एज ए सेट फिट की दवाओं से बंद हो जाते हैं जो डिफिकल्ट केसेस में एज आई ऑलरेडी टोल्ड आई थिंक आई ऑलरेडी टोल्ड सो दिस इज द कम्प्रीहेंसिव एपिलेप्सी केयर सेंटर एट हिंदुजा हॉस्पिटल थैंक यू Thank you so much, Dr. Neelu. Uh, your talk has been crisp. At the same time, uh, she's covered all the practical issues uh, one faces at home, and uh, what not to do and what to do. It was really comprehensive. Thank you so much, and hats off to you uh, to have got uh, have delivered your talk in Hindi. It's more relatable. <laughs> It's quite a challenge for most of us. Yes. <laughs> and being a radiologist i think i could relate to what she was saying that uh, mri does play a very significant role at the same time it doesn't mean that uh, if we as a radiologist don't find any reason doesn't mean that there is no problem so it's a clinical diagnosis and must be uh, treated and uh, like dr uh, jori rightly pointed out even in the beginning that functional mri Uh, is a very important tool in uh, detecting areas of difficulty for children uh, in with respect to speech and vision and uh, while the children are on therapy it's better to have follow up functional mris to see the improvement in these centers uh, and uh, yes so like i had mentioned in the beginning uh, that we'll be having question answer session towards the end so feel free to um, throw questions to the respective speakers okay okay one start to do we figure out uh, how to deal with uh, reading out the questions on zoom is there anything ma'am wants to yeah we're going to gather the questions soon yes ma'am please so uh, i think while uh, the questions are coming up we can just uh, you know request uh, Our chief guest, to, you know, to hand over the mementos to all of our speakers, and Ashok would first hand over, you know, a small memento to you. Yeah, please.
Yeah. Yes, can we have Dr. Mugtha? Thank you for having you. Uh, we are glad to have you here. Dr. Madhura. Sorry, Dr. Madhavi. Dr. Renu. Dr. Hunika Gupta. Her team member is going to take this on her behalf, who gave us an insight to a lot of details with respect to her field. Thank you. Dr. Neelu Desai. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Muk uh, Mr. Mukesh Doshi, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Pankaj Sena. And Dr. Sonali Deshmukh. <laughs> the wonderful job. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And uh, Mr. Umesh Rajay, who is not a speaker, but uh, you know, he has uh, been working with Dr. Ashok Jori, I think, since 40 years. Yes. So we would definitely like to, uh, you know, um, appreciate your, you know, hard work. And uh, all the parents, I'll be sharing all the numbers and the email ID of the speakers, okay? So that will be of uh, great use to you. So you don't have to worry about it. All the numbers and the email IDs of all the speakers will be shared in the parents group. And yeah. thank you, Dr. Usha Jori, for putting this all together. It's been a fantastic Sunday. Yeah, thank We've you, really thank you. learned so much, you know, multidisciplinary in the true sense, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Thank you. Any, yeah, I think we, uh, one person is left out. Yeah, I think we have... Uh, now, uh, we are open for the questions. Uh, whoever, you know, wants to ask some questions, I think you're, yeah, please. We have some questions in the chat box. I think Renu will uh, take over. Dr. Sonali. Yeah, I think we don't have any questions right now in the audience today. Here. Okay, will, she has some on the chat box. Yes. Uh, I think this uh, first question is to uh, Dr. Jori, sir. And uh, there is a parent who would like to know if uh, there is any test to check the level of spasticity so the parents can see and believe in the medicine which was given for the spasticity and stiffness. Okay, so is there any test to know, uh, to check the level of spasticity so the parent can uh, believe that the medicine which is given um, uh, for the spasticity and stiffness is working. So, I think basically Neil will be able to enlighten us on that, you know. We do clinical testing, you know, and we use a scale which is called the Ashworth scale for spasticity, you know. So depending on uh, what sort of response and how far the joint can travel on a fast stretch, you know, we can gauge the amount of spasticity, you know, and we classify that as Ashworth 1, 2, 3, 4. Some, there are two types of scales modified Ashworth and the original Ashworth scale. So we use that for spasticity. 
In clinical practice, we don't resort to any test. But if Neelu wants to add anything. I think uh, Ashwat said is what way, but I think if they want to know what parents can uh, do at home, uh, I think it would be your uh, milestones. You are seeing that whether what he was able to do before, like common reasons where you give medicines is like scissoring or something, tight hai. So if they can you if check that if it can, they are easily able to handle the diapers. So that means they are, it is more of the comfort and ease of managing the child, uh, which will help them. I don't think parents will be able to do any of these scales on their own. Okay, I think the next question will be for Mugda, ma'am. Uh, how can we support uh, parents uh, who are having two children with special needs in terms of acceptance, hope, treatment, therapy, and support? Two children with uh, difficulties, the first thing is you have to love them both equally. Sorry. <laughs> I'll love them both equally but their needs will be different as you would have any two children who are in the mainstream, even children with difficulties, their needs may be a little different, but luckily most of the schools do provide with the same kind of uh, support that is required. But I also work for a couple of deaf schools and I remember this comment from a mom which I am sharing at this time is that she had four children, three of whom were deaf and coming, going to one deaf school. And she'd come to the principal saying, I'll normal wale ko bhi yahi le lo. Better hai mere liye, uske liye dusra school kahan dhundu. So that might be the answer. Yeah. Uh, the next question will be uh, for Mukesh, sir. Um, so this is a question on behalf of all the parents. Uh, the parents says, we feel we have less manufacturers in India for CP chairs batch chairs and those vendors are not ready to give or think on customization and child posture. So any thoughts on this? Uh, what you say is absolutely right. When you make any customized things, you require a little bit time factors. And most of the time, parents don't want to give a time factor to us. So if you give us a time factors, then it is very easy to manufacture everything with us. But we require time as well as a proper prescription from the therapist, which where mother is also involved to make this prescription done. Because whatever, whenever we receive the prescription, we see mother is talking something else, therapist is talking something else, and parents are looking something else. So which is not possible for us to contribute everything together. But if you give us a little bit time, then definitely we can able to do everything, whatever you're looking for a customizations. The next question um, uh, is um, uh, to Mr. Sharan, sir. So the parent wants to know a CP child and their parents mainly bedridden or quadriplegic CP are struggling to get uh, the UDID or Aadhaar card or any other government facility as standing in queue to follow the government process is biggest challenge. So what can we do in this in terms of law and changes in the amendment? So I think that there are many laws in place. The problem, and not only in this situation, is the willingness of people in government to give effect to the laws that are in place. So maybe the changes in the law have taken place, as we've heard. But to enforce these laws, I think that there are certainly ways in which we can do it. And I don't want to uh, elaborate on them right now, except that please keep in mind that if it becomes a situation where government is not responding at all, it would be an appropriate case for the court's intervention. And I, my experience is that the courts have been very proactive and very empathetic towards uh, situations involving disabilities. And I do believe that if the uh, executive or government departments are lethargic, the uh, courts can intervene and make sure that your rights are protected. Okay, so one more point added is, uh, if required, uh, the government agencies are sending people home for the UDID and the Aadhaar card. So that can that facility can be availed of. Then uh, next question is for Dr. Neelu Desai. Uh, there are three or four questions which are yes. asked. Okay. 
Can cannabis oil medicine overcome on seizures? If yes, it is legal. In, is it legal in India? What are the regular blood tests or any other testing needed for epilepsy patient as they are on regular ED? When we should think of VNS? Just wanted to know if there's any case study. So cannabis, yes, it is uh, becoming legalized. And soon, uh, CIPLA company, I think in a month's time, is launching uh, cannabis uh, uh, medicine in India. In By end of this year, we should have it. It has been officially uh, legalized and it would come. Uh, then what are the regular blood tests? See, routinely, no blood tests are needed in epilepsy patients. So like uh, regular, if they're on anti-epileptics, regular liver function or electrolytes is not required. But yes, we do advise tests. Suppose if they have a breakthrough seizure, then we tell them to do the drug level. Or if they are very drowsy, Sometimes, then we ask them to do drug level, some ammonia, liver tests, or electrolytes. And these are sometimes, this is based on doctor's judgment that he will advise what tests to do. But otherwise, routinely, it is not uh, required. When we should think of vagal nerve stimulation, generally only when you, uh, seizures are not controlled by medicines and the patient is not a candidate for epilepsy surgery. So, because epilepsy surgery is curative, uh, anti-epileptic drugs are the easiest way. Vagal nerve stimulation is a palliative thing, in-between thing. It is not a, a cure permanent. It is only that vague, the stimulator, it will sense when the seizure is starting and it will deliver a signal to stop the seizure. But it is not uh, stopping the uh, generation of those seizures. So vagal nerve stimulation is in between things. So only when your medicines have failed, two, three, four medicines have failed, and your patient is not a candidate for epilepsy surgery. So that will be decided based on your neurologist, what he investigates and what uh, finally medicine. And that would be a call taken by the doctor when to start vagal nerve st stimulation. OK, any other question? This one. Uh, then there was one more question um, just regarding um, uh, like what do we do, what options do we have for uh, such children with glasses and uh, yeah obviously in younger uh, age group we can't really do much because glasses is the answer and that is the safest but yes when the child is above 15 years and um, uh, we feel that the child is capable enough of taking care of themselves. There are contact lenses which can be tried. After the age of 18 years, uh, LASIK can be done to uh, take care of glasses. So this is as what the, the rules go as uh, similar to as any other normal child uh, with a refractive error. So those things can be done. Uh, so we don't need to really treat uh, cerebral palsy as anything special regarding to this. All the rules, whichever are whichever ap applicable to any other child, applies to this as well. So the same things can be done, uh, what we do for any other child. Uh, Um, then one more uh, question uh, which had come for uh, uh, Mugdha ma'am, uh, like how do we deal like these, um, there are girl children and how do we deal with the pubertal sports or uh, care regarding periods in these children? That's a tough one. Here, hygiene becomes a very important thing. Because the period will come and will come, unless you have advised your doctor to give you hysterectomy advice. And this is a very nice mode. Do it or do it. But if there are mental faculties, and you can teach the toileting, then you can teach it too. You can teach it too in the same manner of forward chaining or backward chaining behavior, like we learn to clean the toilet and clean the toilet, we can learn to take care of the period. There are some parents who are very innovative about this. Initially, they don't have to clean the toilet for their children. They don't have to clean the toilet for their children. 
अलग अलग वो अंडरवेज रखते थे जिसमें वो पैड लगा के उनके बाथरूम में लगा के रखते थे क्योंकि वो बच्चे को वो पैड का वो निकालना नहीं आता था पर वो अंडरवेज चेंज कर सकती थी तो वो एक ऑप्शन वो कर सकते हैं हमको मालूम है आपको मालूम है आपके बच्चे हमसे बहुत ज़्यादा और आप ये कर सकते हैं इसमें जो भी हेल्प चाहिए होती है एज थेरेपिस्ट हम देते हैं आपको पर एक चीज़ होती है जो बच्चे को आती है उसके ऊपर से हम बाकी का पूरा चेन बिल्ड कर सकते हैं जैसे ये पर्टिकुलर बच्ची थी जिसको अंडरवेयर चेंज करने को आता था तो लिटरली उनके घर में उनकी मम्मी ने कुछ एक्स्ट्रा मतलब जो डार्क कलर के अलग अंडरवेयर होते हैं उनको पैड लगा के एक जगह पर रखा था कि भाई मैं घर पर नहीं रहूँ तो यहाँ पे ये जगह है आप अंडरवेयर चेंज कर लेना बाद में हम फिगर आउट करेंगे कि आगे पैड कैसे लगाना है सो मे बी दैट आंसर द क्वेश्चन any uh, parent would ask any question please uh, feel free to ask nazuka's dad <laughs> marathi madhe vicharla tari chalel ha greater sanit mate school sanit mela ha until they got the girl it is that one of them can gele ani khalis varsha me nazuka kadam गेले अठावी वर्ष फिजिओथेरपी रेगुलर करतो आम्ही अठ्ठावीस वर्ष झाली नाजूक एखादा मी थोडक्यातच सांगेन सात महिने पूर्ण न होता जन्माला आलेली दीड वर्षाचे असताना आम्हाला वाटलं डॉक्टर डॉक्टर फिजिओथेरपिस्ट डॉक्टर हळदीपूरकर यांनी सांगितलं की ही मुलगी सगळं करेल पण उशिरा करेल तेव्हापासून आम्ही सायन हॉस्पिटल के ई एम हॉस्पिटल येथे तिची ट्रीटमेंट फिजिओथेरपी चालू झाली पण नंतर आम्हाला असं वाटलं की आर्थोपेडिक किंवा अतिशय चांगले डॉक्टर यांना दाखवायला पाहिजेत मी मुंबईमधल्या बहुतेक डॉक्टरांना कारण साय हॉस्पिटल मी म्युन्सिपॉलिटीमध्ये असल्या कारणाने मला सगळ्या हॉस्पिटलशी माझा संबंध होता पण अखंड भारताचा अभ्यास केल्यानंतर नंबर एकला अशोक जोहरी डॉक्टर मला भेटले आणि माझ्या मुलीमध्ये जवळजवळ पासष्ट टक्के चांगला डिफरन्स म्हणाला आणि आज ती मुलगी आता या तुम्ही सांगितलात की ज्यावेळेस पिरियड येतो आता ती तीस वर्षाची आहे पिरियड येतो तर काय करायला पाहिजे आता ती नाजुकाच्या आईने सर्व काही तिला शिकवलेलं आहे फक्त एवढंच की ते घे अंडरवेडला लावता येत नाही पण लावून ठेवलं तर चेंज करतं सगळं काय करते स्वतःहून सगळं करते आणि आज ती स्वतः लेखिक आहे आणि ह्याचं कारण हा मॅडम त्याचं कारण असं आहे की ज्यावेळेस ती शाळेत जायचं टा घातलं त्यावेळेस मी येऊन बोललो माझा विचार नव्हता घरी शिकवायचं शाळेत नाही पाठवायचं कारण ह्या मुलांना कोणी चिडवलं काय झालं तर काय प्रॉब्लेम ह्यांची मानसिकता बदली होईल तेव्हा ह्या मॅडमचा सल्ला नाजुकाच्या आईने घेतला मला घेऊन आली जबरदस्तीने कारण त्याने अभ्यास केला कि एकदम स्पष्ट आणि चांगलं बोलणार कान टोचावे म्हणतात ना ते ह्या मॅडमच्याकडून थोडं कडक लागतं बोलतात रागाने पण बोलतात पण त्यांच्या पाठीमागे माया आहे एकदम स्पष्ट बोलणं आहे पण त्याच्यातून घेण्यासारखं आहे मॅडम बोलल्या जर तुम्ही हिला घरातच बसवायचं असेल तर फिजिओथेरपी कशाला करताय हिच्या आठ ऑपरेशन कशाला केली असं मला प्रश्न केला आणि कोणतेही मुलं हिला चिडवणार नाहीत आणि नॉर्मल स्कूलमध्ये पहिली म्युन्सिपॉलिटीमध्ये सातवीपर्यंत नंतर थोडासा वेळ घेतो नंतर ती डॉक्टर शिरोडकर हायस्कूल परेलचं तिथे शिकली आणि नंतर ग्रॅज्युएशन तिने आर्यम भट परेलला तिथे केला आणि एम ए आपल्या सांताक्रूज युनिव्हर्सिटीमध्ये केलं कलीन आला आणि हे सगळं श्रेय चार माणसांना जातं एक नंबरला नाजुकाची आई 
मी काहीच नाही मी फक्त सपोर्टर दोन नंबरला जोहारी सर आणि शिक्षणाच्या बाबतीत नंबर एक आणि सगळ्यात बेस्ट म्हणजे इंदिरा मॅडम आणि जयमाला मॅडम आता जी काय लेखिका झाले तिला महाराष्ट्र राज्य पुरस्कार मिळाला लेखिका म्हणून आणि तिचं तिचं स्वतःचं पुस्तक आहे कोरोनामध्ये तिने खूप लेख लिहिले त्याचा आम्ही संग्रह केला आणि एक हृदयस्पर्शी कथा म्हणून तिने लिहिलेला आहे आणि आत्ता ती फिजिओथेरपी काय गरज आहे आणि फिजिओथेरपी आणि आर्थोपेडिक डॉक्टर्स हे गावी पाहिजेत मुंबई सिटीमध्ये किंवा पुणे कलकत्ता इकडे नको गावी पाहिजेत कारण चालताना पडतात मोडतात त्यांना फिजिओथेरपीची गरज आहे असं त्याच्यावर तिने वीस पानाचं एक लेख लिहिला आहे मराठीत लिहिते सगळ्या भाषेत आणि ह्याचं परत परत सांगेन लि पुस्तक लिहायला लावणं काही करणं ह्यानी कान उपटले आणि दुसरी हे लोक फक्त श्रीमंतांचीच कामं करतात असं नाही गरीबांना सुद्धा मदत करणारी नंबर एक जोडी अशोक ज्वारी आणि मॅडम माझ्या मुलीची कितीतरी ऑपरेशन दोन ऑपरेशन त्यांनी अतिशय म्हणजे फक्त काय म्हणतात त्याला अवजार लागली ना ऑपरेशन करताना त्याचेच पैसे घेतले स्वतःचे पैसे घेतले नाही येण्याच त्याचे पैसे घेतले नाही इतकी गरीबांना मदत करणारे अशोक ज्वारी आणि नाजूकला दीड दोन वर्षापासून चष्म्याचं आज तिचा नंबर आहे सोळा मायनस ह्या मॅडमच्याकडे आणि मॅडम तुमचा एक नंबर घेऊन जाईन मी कारण का नाजूकाला जे लिखाण करणार आहे त्याच्यात तुमच्या विचारांची गरज आहे एवढं मला बोलायला दिल्याबद्दल अत्यंत आभारी आहे आणि मी म्हणेन ना की डॉक्टर हे आपलं काम करतातच डॉक्टर मराठी समजतं नाही तर हिंदीत बोलतो डॉक्टर आपलं काम करतातच पण डॉक्टरांबरोबर जर पेशंट चांगला व्हायचा असेल तर आई वडिलांनी त्याच्या दहा पटीने मदत मुलांसाठी करायला पाहिजे आता यांनी यांनी सांगितलं पहिला चान्स घेतला दुसरा पण तसंच होईल मी ज्या वेळेस आज लोक सांगतायत मुलगी पाहिजे एकोणीसशे एक्क्याण्णवलाच मी माझ्या बायकोला सांगितलं आई वडिलांना सांगितलं मला मुलगी झाली मला खूप आनंद आहे या पुढे ह्या मुलीला मी उभी करेन मला दुसऱ्या मुलाची गरज नाही मी राजा नाही किंवा माझ्याकडे करोडोची ब्लॅ मालमत्ता नाही की त्याला वारस पाहिजे ही मुलगी हेच माझं आणि त्याचं कारण असं आहे की दोन मुलं काय तीन मुलं होऊन देत पण त्याचा त्रास कोणावर होतो बाईवर होतो तुमच्या आमच्यावर होत नाही ती एकाला बघणार का दुसऱ्याला बघणार दुसऱ्याला बघणार का ते मग तिच्यावर अन्याय करायचा कुठचाही अधिकार नाही आपण जिकडे जाल तिथे सांगा की जास्त करून मुलांचं संगोपन करण्याची जबाबदारी बाईची असते तर तिला पूर्णपणे शंभर टक्के सहकार्य पुरुषाने करायला पाहिजे आज बघा आज सरांना शंभर टक्के सहकार्य आहे आणि स सरांचं सहकार्य त्यांना आहे इतकी स्पष्ट एकमेकाला एवढे शिकलेले असून एवढे सगळं काय असून सुद्धा दोन्ही जोडे आमच्या समोर आदर्श आहे अतिशय प्रेमाने वागणारी नवरा बायको आहे त्या आपण मला बोलायला दिल्याबद्दल आभारी आहे आणि तुमच्यासारख्या बुद्धिवंतांसमोर मी काय पामर बोलणार चुकीचे शब्द असतील ते मागे घेतो चांगले असेल तर तुम्ही कानामध्ये साठवून ठेवा आणि असाच प्रत्येक हँडिकॅपला आपण उभा राहण्यासाठी सहकार्य करा एवढंच बोलेन Hi, thank you everyone and uh, privileged to be a part of this event. I think uh, it took almost two and two and a half hours to elaborate the problems of a cerebral palsy. Brain, se leke, aak, se leke, mouth, se leke, daat, se leke. My child is 23 years old. 
अरे अभी तक कोई इंस्टीट्यूट नहीं देखा जहाँ पर मे बी आई एम इमोशनल फॉर दिस पर्टिकुलर टाइम राइट अवे जहाँ पर अंडर वन रूफ सब कुछ हो एवरी डॉक्टर लाइक मे बी फिजियोथेरापिस्ट ई आर ई एन टी ऑर्थोपेडिक न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट एक एक के पास जाना पड़ता है छः छः घंटे पाँच पाँच घंटे चार चार घंटे यू कीप ऑन वेटिंग एंड ऑलवेज यू प्रीफर टू हैव अ बेस्ट ऑफ यूर योर चाइल्ड डू यू प्रोफेशनल डू यू एज अ पेरेंट्स एंड डू यू डॉक्टर्स ओवर थिंक देर इज नो स्पेशल मे बी हॉस्पिटल विच इज मेन फॉर ऑर्थोपेडिक स्पेशल चाइल्ड एक शूज बनाने जाना है चार घंटे लगते हैं प्लास्टरिंग करेगा पी ओ पी करेगा मोल्ड करेगा एंड मैन ऑफ पेरेंट्स की फोन रनिंग हियर एंड देयर माहिम टू हिंदू जा हिंदू जा टू ब्रिज कैंडी ब्रिज कैंडी टू पुणे वे वर आई थिंक मोर ऑफ डॉक्टर्स हैव कम फ्रॉम पुणे और समथिंग मैं भी काफ़ी वो इंडिया के अंदर भागा में हुई है अप्रोच एनी वेयर सो आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल प्रोफेशनल स्पेशल डॉक्टर जो ही एंड ऑल द कंसल्ट डॉक्टर्स वो ही Why do you people cannot make or take an initiative to have an organization like this? There are multiple donors in life, you know. I would say every parent who has been involved in this has emotional touch with the values. But I have not seen any such initiative in my 23 years of life and spending. I joined Dr. Jory, I think, uh, um, maybe in 2006 with the first surgery I had for my child. Since I'm him knowing, definitely he's been working for uh, I think two or a night, two or three. to get an appointment for years you one has to wait i'm not blaming him for because i'm i'm de- i'm giving the dedication like he's working till after working till 2 am in the morning he's not able to give an appointment for one year everybody wants that he comes to dr jory as and somebody has spoken like that to have it been with dr jory as a privilege and to her best for the child like you know but waiting for a year after appointment again or six months How a person can be treated, where everything, every moment of the life is very precious in that cerebral palsy. As the bachus grows on, the damage of the brain, the physical fitness is damaged. So, kya lagta hai? How to handle this sort of situation? To go to physiotherapy, you know, every time it takes one and a half hours or one hour of time. Um, there is a queue again, waiting appointments. You have to do till you know, schedule life of yours. Because you cannot be 24 by 7 for a child, I think. Because what I have, my my wife blames to me, you have not given us sufficient time to your kid probably. But you have to manage number of things and other things as well. Even doctors have to manage their family lives and everything. They cannot be 24 by 7 to the uh, patient. Do have emotional values for them. So my suggestion and my kind request for all of you um, professionals, uh, maybe and the lawyers is there. I've heard his speech. Uh, Great man is facing the problem. Uh, I think he has personal issues, so he understand. Even there is no bylaws or something like that, which gives maybe there are there there are very you know few and maybe slow process to a uh, judgment. For example, just like ID, for you can move if the body is not working. So, if the doctor's appointment is not being heard, the judge's summa ita is not heard. The whole life is lost for ID. So, our system in India is very slow over here. नहीं आई एम फेसिंग आई कून बीन कूपर फॉर दिस आई डी ब्राइब के सिवा कुछ नहीं मैम इफ यू वॉन्ट अवेंटी परसेंट एटी परसेंट इज हाउ मच डेफिशियंसी यू वॉन्ट अस्सी परसेंट चाहिए नब्बे परसेंट चाहिए सी आई हैव सफर ट्वेंटी थ्री ईयर्स इन माई लाइफ एंड आई बीन टू ऑल द स्पैंस टू लोकल बॉडीज टू डॉक्टर्स एंड एवरीथिंग आई एम नॉट ब्लेमिंग आई एम जस्ट आस्किंग सजेशन एंड आस्किंग हेल्प फ्रॉम योर साइड आई वुड बी फर्स्ट टू यू नो टेक आई बीन अ स्मॉल डोनर टू द फाउंडेशन ऑफ द जोरी साहब जब उन्होंने मुझे बताया था Because I'm just made twice or thrice to him. So, if there is such an initiative, Lena, please. Because giving a speech on microphones, talking about the things, handling the issues, fine enough. Oh, here he will get up and go. 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 He ओके वहाँ मोबाइल फोन्स में या जाके कि इंडिया न्यूजीलैंड का मैच देखने बैठ जाएंगे प्रॉब्ली दिस इज गोइंग टू हैपन बिकॉज आई लाइक द स्पीच द वे सी सेड एंड वेरी वेरी यू नो इफेक्टिव एंड कॉमेडी वे लाइक कॉमेडी मीन्स लाइक यू नो आई मीन टू से लाइक आई एम टेकिंग टाइम बिकॉज आई एम शेयरिंग माई इमोशन इफ समथिंग कैन हैपन गुड वी वी कैन इनिशिएटिव वी नी टेक द इनिशिएटिव टू यू नो स्टार्ट विद समथिंग दिस इज वेरी यू नो बिकॉज यू आर प्रोफेशन ऐसा कुछ कर सकते हैं तो आई विली लव टू बी अ पार्ट ऑफ दिस and i'm ending with this my words because i think i don't know how it is going to work but definitely somebody has to take the initiative and it starts maybe the 
uh, uh, parents will be more privileged and helpful for them. Thank you very much. Uh, with your answer, uh, we already started a rehabilitation institute where everything is available under one roof. And uh, you can stay also there with your one patients and the relatives. If you cannot afford the cost, it is a free of cost. And uh, it is in the Kutch. Institute already received the national award four times. And uh, we have an OPD of per day more than 250 patients with 50 patients indoor facilities. All doctors of Bombay, on a respected areas, respected days, they visit the scientists, they guide the scientists. Therapy, everybody, our residential staff are there, and they take care of everything. P&O department, every department are there under one roof. So I request anybody would like to visit, please do visit to Kutch. In December, 15th of December to 25th of December, we are doing a 15,000 children's screening for all these activities, including dental, healthcare, and everything, please do join as a volunteers, join as a doctors, whatever you have a capacity, and uh, support us and see the things, how last 50 years we are doing these services. Thank you very much. I think Dr. Juhar is also there. No, I just want to say, you know, each of us is so busy in our professional lives, you know, it becomes very difficult to get everyone together so these thoughts have crossed our minds many a times, you know, and many a times I have spoken to many patients that something must happen for these children, you know, also looking at the long term. What is going to happen when the parents are not there? You know, it's a big question, question ahead, you know. Unfortunately, we don't have that sort of a catalyst, you know, who can get everybody together and be a prime mover for this, you know. Because for me to be involved uh, would mean that I stop all my work and get involved in this, you know. So I have requested many parents, you know. Unfortunately, talks have not proceeded beyond, you know. We even made a blueprint for a rehab center. Parents were involved in that, you know, some. But when it comes to actual execution, nothing happens, you know. If we can get together with the parent body, you know, we are there for um, whatever expertise we have, you know. All of us are there and we can get everyone involved in that, you know. There should be somebody who is capable of raising donors' money, getting government help, things like that, you know. So those are our problems, you know. While we are good at our job, I think this falls. We should be good at other things, I know, but it is just not possible, you know. Yeah. Moving with the government, getting the government to do things, or getting private initiatives, getting it going, you know, becomes a big problem, you know. So we require, even if one catalyst is there, we are able to put a 100% into that. Even if one catalyst comes forward and says, okay, I take this responsibility, you know, I'm going to get this done. We can give you the vision for it. We can give you the manpower for it, who's involved, you know. We can point out the sources to you, how things can be done, you know. But somebody has to do that ground level work, you know. That is where all the problem is coming. Another issue typically with Bombay, you know, is that um, you mentioned that you have to go to n number of specialists, you have to wait for every, I totally agree with your point of view. Getting together people, getting five people together has to happen only on Sunday, you know, because everyone, somebody is involved somewhere, somebody is involved somewhere, and getting five people under one roof is a absolutely very difficult task in Bombay at least, you know. So while that is what you're saying is a futuristic thing, it will happen in the future, I think still there'll be some time for this to happen. We are realizing the importance of this more and more as we are going on in our jobs, you know, that, oh, I want an opinion from so-and-so, I want an opinion from so-and-so, you know, and then the whole link is lost because that appointment happens after two, three months. The parents don't come back to report or they feel doctor is so busy, I can go and tell the report, you know, or sometimes they email, so that's fine, you know, but those are all the practical difficulties. We just require one person to be the catalyst and who can devote his full time for this, and I'm sure this can happen. So two more questions. Uh, somebody just asked, uh, what is a good age uh, for surgery, or before what time should it be done? OK, so question of orthopedic surgery, when, you know? So even the world is divided as to when orthopedic surgery should be done. Um, generally, we prefer to do it late, so that relapses and repetition of surgery does not happen, you know. 
still there are chances you operate somebody at 13. By the time he comes back to you at the age of 15, there are again contractures, you know, because efforts slacken. At the time of surgery, everyone is very much involved. As the days pass by, the efforts are not as much, and then they become tight again, you know. But my take on this is that surgery should be done bef if a problem is progressive, if a deformity is progressive, and if that is affecting other levels. So you started with the foot. OK, you have a equinus problem or a foot which is like that, you know. And now the position of your knee is bent, you know. And now you're developing a problem at the knee. And then the hip muscles are getting tight because the hip is like that, you know. So instead of one problem, waiting for that one problem, I'll do it when the child becomes big, you know. But now I have three problems to tackle, you know, by the time the child has become big. So many times we try to explain this to the parents, you know. But uh, parents are not that proactive. They say, kahan se suna hai? Bada hoga tabhi karana hai, surgery. Can't we carry on, you know. You could do something else, you know. We do physiotherapy, carry on. But my take on this is before irreversible changes happen or before changes happen at other level, I think we should intervene. Uh, one more, I think, last question for Mugda, ma'am. Um, how do uh, parents handle uh, children's uh, emotional outbursts and uh, issues when they also have other physical issues? Uh, so, how to handle that? Emotional outbursts? Or are you saying tantrums? <laughs> so, both with a lot of love and with a lot of patience on your part. So, may I take two minutes of all the parents, and if you can do this with me. Take a deep breath in. Let it go. Now, in through the nose and blow it out through the mouth. Get yourselves calm and then deal with the child. With the, with the child is worked up, we as parents also tend to get worked up. And two worked up people, there's no calming of the situation. And then, that usually works the best. And a very, very important thing for the parents. It doesn't, see for me as a therapist, you step out of my door, I have the next problem or the next person coming in. For you, there is no such thing. There is no break. Do not feel guilty to take a break from the situation. And please do take it. And to all the papas here, give that break to the mamas in the house. They need it. The break can be just, not, I'm not saying a whole day. I'm not saying, jao, go out, trip pe. I am saying, agar wo chai pee rahi hai, to wo chai peene ke time pe, that is also enough for her to deal with the rest of the day. And that is why there was the mother there on that ball. The father wasn't there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so we've come towards the end of this program, the wonderful program that we had. Um, so, word of thanks will be given by uh, Prasoon Jewelry. Here you go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of uh, IACP Global Vision, Brain Alliance, and the Jewelry Medical and Research Foundation, it is my honor to give this vote of thanks to uh, chiefly the chief guest of today's function, Mr. Sharan Jaktiani and Mrs. Ami Jaktiani. Thank you for gracing us, for giving us half your Sunday. Um, all the speakers, starting with my father, Dr. Ashok Johri, Dr. Madhvi Kelapure, and I think uh, we've come from Pune with uh, Dr. Renu, uh, Dr. Mugda Shan, Mr. Pankaj Sina, Dr. Renu Agar Khedkar, who's also the program coordinator for today, uh, Dr. Himika Gupta and the team, Mr. Mukesh Doshi, and Dr. Neelu Desai. Thank you to you know, all of you for speaking. Uh, she's coming. <laughs> the compare and host for today's program, Dr. Sunali Deshmukh, who's also come all the way from Pune for this program. Uh, it was fantastic. All the parents uh, and the young children who, you know, patiently been listening, 
here as well as online on Zoom. We've had a few participants, and thank you for coming. And you know, without you, this program would have no meaning. Thank you for taking out the time and coming. And the gentleman whose uh, passionate query, you know, there's no answer to it. But I'm sure it will, you know, uh, make all of us think if it if it can be, you know, achieved. Uh, there have been a few companies that have supported this program today. Neurocare Division, Gufik, uh, Mr. Umesh Rajay, sir, thank you. And, and Java Pharmaceuticals, uh, we've also, you know, uh, supported this program. Uh, the program coordinators uh, and the brainchild behind this, brain behind this program, Dr. Usha Jori and Dr. Renu Agar Khedkar, thank you for putting together this wonderful program. And all, all the support staff, uh, you know, the audiovisual team, Mr. Yogesh, Mr. Sachin, and you know, their colleagues, the clinic staff, Mr. Umesh, Vijaya, uh, Trupti, uh, you know, thank you for, you know, all of you for taking out, you know, half a Sunday and, you know, doing this. We have uh, some snacks upstairs, so I would like to request all of you to please, you know, come upstairs, have some snacks, and then we can disperse. Well, I would also like to thank Sarah and Ira who put up such a wonderful performance and their mother, Prajakta. Um, Prajakta and Paru, uh, Prasuna have been encouraging both these kids, you know, to take part in various activities and this is just one of them, you know, so thank you. Thank you to Prasuna also. It's No, it is, it is Prasuna's birthday today. So. <laughs> So this was, uh, he's been, I think he's been supporting uh, Sir and Jory Ma'am a lot and uh, he's put in a lot of effort in the entire program. So I think it was a great celebration and thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, uh, thank you for, you know, your wishes. Uh, my mother is a Leo and I would like to say when a Leo commands that something is to be done, <laughs> you don't say no. And, but thank you, you know, for your wishes. Please, please join us upstairs.